Oh, hey, what's up, everybody? I was about to say how we are such good friends, Alexandra Botez and I, coming your way with FideChess.com Women's Speeches Champion Commentary. Alexandra, I know we had a little bit of a, a tiff yesterday. Do you forgive me? Well, I think I got you back with my last tweet. I know you really loved it. So I think we're even, Robert. Uh, that's what you call even. Wait till I get you back. But in the meantime, speaking of not being even, let's look at the leaderboard for the Women's Speeches Championship because there right now is one player, Ana Ushinina, who's finished her event. And while she makes it the super final, she was in first place after her three events. However, Valentina Gunina has won her match yesterday and thus is tied. So it gets a little complicated and we'll sort through the weeds. But Alexandra, as you look from through the standings here, we know three... Three players, Alexander Kostenyuk, Sara Kanemostria, Hoi Fan. They need to win this Grand Prix just to be able to qualify themselves to the Super Final. So when you look at the standings, what do you make of them? Well, it's crazy to see Hoi Fan in any type of women's chess tournament not be near the top. But of course, she was really dominating her match yesterday. So I imagine she's going to be one of the likely participants to qualify, even though, um, you know, Kostinyuk and Sarah have more, more points than her so far. It's going to be interesting to see them battling it out today. That's very true. And those three players from fourth through sixth place, they absolutely have no choice. They need to win this Grand Prix leg. And Valentina Gunina has scooted up with her performance as far. I believe she's received two points thus far. So if she wins her match today, she secures qualification into the Super Final. The top two players in the standings make it there. And well, as you see, 22, 20, 20, 12, 10, 10. Let's go to what, how you earn those points in addition to the dollar dollar bills, because $3,000 for first place and 12 points. So with Kusinik at 12, with uh, Hoi Fan and Sara there with 10, if they win the event, they get 12 points. That gets them to 22 or 24 if you're Kusinik, and that would invite you into the super final so right and the super final has a prize fund of ten thousand dollars with six thousand five hundred going to the winner and three thousand five hundred to the runner-up so a lot of motivation to make it there uh what that's a, a lot of money i didn't actually know that yeah so I, I just i just got word in slack so that's passing you dropping it on. knowledge on me i've been so focused on you know all that's happened and i haven't looked to what is going to happen so thank you for dropping that little nugget of knowledge on me because that is a heck of a lot of money. So these players really want to earn their way to the super final chance at $6,500 first place prize. Well, Robert, on a kind of related note, International Chess Day, is it today or is it coming up? And do you have any plans? Well, I believe that the International Chess Day is the 20th? The 20th, okay. Because I've already been getting messages with International Chess Day, kind of like those greetings you send to people. Um, but good to know I still have some time there. Yeah, and I, I'm pretty sure I do have plans. And I kind of hate to admit it so publicly, but those plans do include you. And it's because the set, uh, super final of this Women's Speeches Championship, it's on the, the 20th, and we're going to be commentating that together so i feel like that must have been done on purpose so it's okay i'm, I'm looking forward to that <laughs> i am as well i just have this i can't be so friendly with you to start the day i feel like we need to have our little you know banter back and forth here can't be friends all the time can we apparently not robert apparently not i mean you are starting off on the right foot today you apologize we we're talking some chess i thought things were gonna go well but you know we, you never know uh, yeah, they, they're going to go well. That's when. That's sure. Oh, great comment in chat. When is International Hess Day? Isn't that every day? I guess I guess that's what you feel like. What's a day in the life of Hess like? What is that a serious question? I don't know. Just some inspiring words for people who want to celebrate Hess Day. They just have to come on to Twitch, look for the chess channel, and they will find me here. And they will be able to celebrate by watching chess, learning some chess, and hopefully enjoying just uh, my glowing personality, right? Oh, absolutely, Robert. Um, 
and Tagvon just put a hilarious comment. Hey, Tagvon, it's great to see you. Robert missing the one hour free time before Alexandra shows up when he can roast her mercilessly. No, that's the thing, though. I would never roast you if we weren't hanging out together because that's not really my style. I don't say things behind people's back. I don't post things on Twitter without them knowing about it that may or may not be borderline offensive. I say it, <laughs> everything I need to say to the person's face. So, Well, 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 well. You know, Robert, you just want to see my reaction when you roast me. That's the real reason. Yeah, well, sometimes you just need to be roasted like a pig in a blanket. So um, anyway, are we going to use real chess terms today or are we going to continue to make them up? I think it's a little more fun when you throw in a random chess term, right? Isn't that what made chess a little bit more popular on Twitch? Yeah, it's cool when people who are just starting at chess do that. But when people who have been playing chess their whole <laughs> life make up just ridiculous phrases that they think are real, it's not the fact that it's not real. It's the fact that you thought that that was a legitimate turn of phrase. And I was like, Mm, Alexandra, I've literally never heard that. And I know I'm not Canadian, but that's not really a legit excuse. So anyway, chess is happening. The games have been taken I was off half here. right. I was half right. It was pigs on the seventh, pigs in the blanket. It's, just, it's creative interpretation. But all right, what game do you want to start off with? Well, actually, I was going to let you choose. But now that you ask me, I'll just stay in the game that we're at here with Yifan taking on Zonsaya Abdul-Malik. We heard from her yesterday after her match win. She didn't know she was going to play Hoi Fan after winning, but then when we told her, she was pretty excited about it, wasn't she? She was, and I found it funny that she said, oh man, it's Hoi Fan. I'm not even going to try to prepare. It seemed like she feels it's one of those impossible tasks, and she's just going to go there, try her best, and, you know, analyze the games after. I think that she... It was saying like, you know, she's admitting, she's acknowledging Yifan is the strongest player, but that doesn't mean that she has to count herself out. So I do think that she believes in herself. She seems to be a person who is generally in great spirits. And right now in this position here, Yifan is taking up quite a bit of time. So that's odd to me. It's a very natural position. This is already, it's move nine. So it's pretty early in this game. And she played C3. So one of the things that we haven't spoken too much about, Alexandra, but I'm curious your thoughts. What kind of rust is there for Yifan? She's somebody who, of course, is an elite player, but somebody who's been busy at school and now has become a professor. She doesn't play over the board chess very regularly, and I don't believe she's playing online that much either. So what do you think about the rust factor as she plays somebody like Sansaya Abdul That's a great question. She definitely is not an active player anymore in the way that she used to be, so she's not at her peak anymore. Would you consider her retired? Uh, I don't know. That's a good question that I haven't really considered. I think that she is not as active as people would like, but I wouldn't call her retired. She still competes every now and then in over-the-board chess. She, of course, has been playing in this event, and she's been playing well. Once she's found her footing, she made it to the final of the previous Grand Prix leg here in the first match yesterday. She was an absolute force, and now she's into the quarterfinal where if she can continue winning and then wins out, all the way through the final of this Grand Prix leg, she will actually be a qualifier for the Super Final. And I think that someone like Ana Ushanina, Valentina Gunia, they're like, hey, can somebody stop Hoyifan? Like, don't let her keep winning because then she gets her momentum and whatever, retired or not, she's clearly unretired for this event and she was looking to wreak havoc on her opposition. Right. And one thing to add there, I think it would be easier to keep playing rapid time controls online if you're not playing as actively than in classical tournaments where preparation is a lot more. So she can certainly rely a lot on her previous knowledge and she's still, you know, the highest rated female player right now. So a force to be reckoned with regardless. On that note, I guess we can go to the game. So it looks like White has, so she has her knight on a three. Is this something you commonly see in the Roy Lopez? Yeah, you do when White plays A4. So the point is to put some pressure on the B5 square. But what's really concerning me is that, I mean, Zansaya played a very normal move, queen to B6 to protect this pawn on B5, to connect the rooks with one another. And that way the, the rook can go to D8 and maybe eventually black can even try to play for D5. That will take quite a bit of time because the knight on F3 is poking at this pawn E5. So it is curious to me that Yifan is spending so much time here 
And for Zansai, I think this is the strategy she needs to go with. I don't think that black is better or anything here, but because this bishop's on e3, white may have d4, you need to parry off Ifan's threats in the immediate position. Otherwise, white will be clearly better. And if there's no kind of obvious next move, I think that's where Ifan continues to burn some of her clock. And I think that is Zansai's greatest chance. And knight g4, great move, because b4 would then have been met by knight takes bishop over on e3. So what do you make of this position, Alexandra? Well, she just retreated very quickly here. She didn't even have to think about it. She certainly wants to keep her bishop fair. I guess, as we just touched on, black has more space on the queen side. I do like c4, so she's going for even more than she already has, but in exchange, Hoi Fan is able to capture the center here. I think this could go either way. Um, I'm not a Royal Lopez player myself, but in, in general, I'm used to having less space in the center, so I would probably but prefer this with the black pieces. You also are used to having bad light square bishops, and so tell me a little more about this bishop on a2 right now. Okay, I understand. That bishop is blocked by a pawn, but at least it's not a, a closed position. Um, we're putting pressure on the b5 pawn that's connecting the c pawn, but we're not going to be able to get rid of it right away, and there's no great place to reroute the bishop. You can't go bishop to b1 because then you would actually be blocked by your e4 pawn here. So I find white's pieces kind of clumsy, and it's it's difficult to find a good plan here. Maybe reroute your knight to b4 eventually. That's, well, you say it's difficult to find a good plan, and then you come up with that. So that looks really interesting to me. And what has c5 to c4, that pawn move done for black? Mm -hmm. Well, it's opened up the queen on b6. It restricted the bishop. But what has it done for white? It's how you should always consider even the smallest of pawn moves. What has it gained for me, but what does it concede to my opponent? And that b4 square is an interesting one for this knight to be routed itself to. Ooh, bishop a3, e3, excuse me, tried to win this pawn on b5, but that's why Zansai actually moved her knight into c5 so she can keep her queen on b6 where it protects this b5 pawn. And I'm waiting for white to try to play pawn to b4 or this much slower maneuver, some kind of bishop b1, bishop c2. The bishop's not really doing all that much from c2 either, and that kind of concerns me but the good news about bishop b1 is it stops black from playing f5 so easily because f5 is an idea that in some lines black would like to play especially with uh white center e4 and d5 you undermine it and that way you can try to attack and win the pawns later that's actually a really interesting idea because it's still a very close position both players are two minutes or under two minutes on the clock now and in a lot of moments like this, you're just trying to figure out anything you could try to do. Even slight improvements from the position of your pieces is very helpful here. Do you think she should ever consider taking on b5? Not anytime soon. Because mm -hmm. taking on b5 would just open up this rook on a8. And as we talk about what pieces can improve, that rook on a8 can't really improve very easily unless the position opens up. So kind of releasing the tension there. It's not just about the pawn on pawn attack. It's more so about the pieces that are uh, behind that pawn. And Bishop C8 was played, as I pointed out, to play F5, but it also allows this man A5 to retreat back to B7 if needed. And, uh, you know, I don't really like the look of a knight on B7. It's not really going anywhere useful. However, if you open up the A file, then I really will consider it because my rook on A8 will have some life down the line. Yeah, fair, fair enough here. Um, now Hoi Fan is a minute under the clock. What, what's your prediction? Do you think that Jensaya might start off this match with an upset? Well, Jensaya, she is in good form. She's playing very quickly, and I think that's the best thing that she's doing. Her position is absolutely fine here. And B this B4 move, after taking on Passan, I'm wondering if, like, Ifan's internet, it, it has four bars here, so she's clearly connected. But she spent a lot of time on how to capture back after spending a minute and 25 seconds on b4 in the first place, that's not good time management. And you see a pair of knights being traded. Black can just play you know, bishop to b7 to finish her development, even though the bishop was already on b7 mm -hmm. and just rerouted itself. And Black's position is looking stable. And your question about taking on b5, she didn't do so precisely because opening the a file did not appeal to her. All right. Well, she moved her bishop away. Um, Jansaya could not have taken it right away regardless because the knight was pinned but she does realize that at some point the queen is going to move away like like she just did 
and here if you don't take on b5 i mean you have to keep protecting a4 which is kind of tricky so she decided to finally take um but that knight on a3 now is looking really awkward and the bishop on c2 took away its square that it could have used to reroute to a better position yeah and actually a good multi-purpose move for black is rook to a5 to, ah rook b8 is fine and maybe actually it's better but i was looking at rook a5 to protect b5 to a double on the a file and she instead plays rook to b8 and bishop d3 was the choice by the font she's really trying to get after this b5 pawn and give herself the c2 square for her knight she is mm -hmm. down a minute on the clock alexandra so what does your gut tell you in this game here white is probably just slightly worse but with the time disadvantage do you think that yifan's going to be able to pull this one off well that's that's interesting with 20 seconds to a minute in a position where i think she's worse but she's a stronger player and to me it would just still be you know pretty impressive for Jensaya to beat her in the first game with the black pieces i i feel like koi found is going to save this somehow it's just my gut feeling and rook a5 knight c2 rerouting happens i i don't know i mean Jensaya is extremely strong but the last couple moves, I feel like she's a bit, been a bit hesitant. She didn't play rook a5 to start with. She put a rook on b8. Then mm -hmm. she spent 38 seconds to play a rook a5 once the pawn was under attack. And now again, she spent 18 seconds. It feels like she's not quite in her comfort zone. That's that's fair. Um, okay, so uh -oh, she... Uh-oh. Rook a1 and then rook a7 is exactly what's about to happen. Once well... So Ho Yi Fan did did pull it off. I think there's there's some psychology there too when you're playing so much stronger than you. Um, even if you're in a better position, I don't know. Maybe she has already mastered this, but you feel a little bit more nervous. That's true. Oh, maybe be one. It caught me off guard. It doesn't change the situation. She's going to get her set two pieces for the rook. That's what mm -hmm. Ho Yi Fan just received. And b4 was a smart move because the knight wants to go to c6. At the very least, by giving mm -hmm. up a pawn, the rook now has more life in the position. So it's a good, instructive moment for people, even though it's not going to really change the dynamic of the position in the sense that white is better. It does change black's opportunity. So I should have rephrased it. It changes the dynamic. It doesn't change the objective evaluation. Yeah, that sounds pretty fair. So Ho Yi Fan has a knight and a bishop for a rook. Um, what is Jinsaya's best plan to try to maybe, you know, get away with a draw here? Exactly what she did. Note that a bishop on the light squares cannot attack any pawns on dark squares. And mm -hmm. look at where black's pawns are on dark squares. So if the knight ever reroutes, black goes king to e7. Okay, you're, how are you going to attack any of my pawns? If we start trading off a bunch of pawns, it feels like we're getting closer and closer to a position where black should be able to hold. And as we see here, pawns traded. Note, light square bishop h8 is a dark square so you know that one of the things you may need to accomplish is trading off this I mean, you, it's going to be complex to visualize this in your head but i'll explain more i guess a bit later i always point out though when there's a bishop and a rook pawn you have to look if they match it's a very important thing to discover and it feels like hoi fan is still pushing for a win here um Jensai is doing a good job at pinning the the bishop to the king so she can't make a lot of progress by like moving king to g3 but what she has managed to do is now stick that pawn on f5 so she does have a target now where the light squared bishop and knight can attack it together yeah that was interesting move to play f5 i actually think it was a bad move but it wasn't the knight should have come to c4 i really thought the knight from a c4 to put pressure on d6 you want to create a pass pawn and here black can show king g5 and what this is becoming more evident of what needs to be accomplished. And you're winning the h5 pawn, so it's not that big a deal. Uh, I wanted to get to that bishop in wrong rook pawn. We're not getting there. Instead, these the bishop is tied down to the knight, so you can't block the check with the bishop rook takes e5. Oh, we're mm -hmm. gonna draw on the spot. So the the only chance how you found it would have had here is if she was able to capture the d6 pawn, because otherwise, if she gets stuck with a bishop and a knight then Jinsai can just sack the rook for either piece. So we saw that game end in a draw. Uh, that seemed kind of like a fair result. Sarah was leading the entire time, she, or she had a slightly better position, time advantage, made a blunder, but was able to hold a draw. She was indeed. So why don't we go to the other matchup where Valentina Gunina mm -hmm. won her first game against Humpy Canero. We'll mm -hmm. check out what's going on in game two. Ooh, so Valentina won with the black pieces in the first game. She now has 
uh, the white pieces, I know it's a Petrov defense based on these pawns here on C3 and C2. I'm going to highlight them in green rather than red. You know, double pawns often get a bad reputation, but Alexandra, can you explain to people why the double pawns may not be so bad here? Well, in this position, they're also very important to help defend the white king and control some of the central squares while also opening up the semi-open D file for more peace activity. So controlling B4, D4, those pawns are actually making double pawns get a better reputation. I certainly agree with that. And I think that the Petrov is seen as this like drawish opening or boring opening. But as we've seen players like Fabiano Kar one, uh, uh, Yu Yang Yi and all of these uh, top Chinese players, they play the Petrov not just to make a draw, but to play to stabilize their position. And sometimes they actually play for really aggressive intentions on the queen side. And here with these pawns on C2 and C3 like this, as you point out very importantly, that the open D file is to white's benefit. It's a semi-open file because white's rook has an opening all the way up into black's pawn. Whereas if you look at this black rook on D8, it's staring into nothing. You don't have space for your pieces. So having double pawns is not always a bad thing. It be can become bad when because double pawns can't protect each other. Pawns mm -hmm. protect diagonally from adjacent files. These pawns have no business protecting each other being stacked in a row. So just some of the important elements to point out and discuss. And, all right, now that we've gone over the double pawns and this bishop came to D4, what do you make of that move? Giving up the bishop for the knight potentially it feels pretty strange um i understand trying to get rid of the knight on c6 um occasionally when you have some kind of attack since it's such an important piece so it must be some kind of dynamic reason that she's doing it where it's good in this position um but it, it's it's i can't really point a point a finger on it yeah it did feel it feels a little odd in a sense because you are putting pressure on g7, but are you really? Because isn't f2 uh, needing the bishop's defense? And if knight takes d4, I was wondering if white would take back with the queen and try to sneak that queen to a7. It's one of these like soft squares that you don't often realize is a problem. And instead, Humpy took on g4, rook g1 quickly played to hit the queen and behind it this g6 pawn. And I'm looking at queen h5 as a possibility here. Same thing. Let's trade queens, because if we trade on h5 and I take with the pawn, my pawn would have become an outside pass pawn, a flank pawn. Instead, she plays queen f5 and is going to trade in this manner. And I think that black is completely fine here. And as we enter the end game, Alexandra, then the double pawns are probably not a great thing. So if what about black's double pawns? I was going to say, is there any way white could have, I guess white, could have tried to save the f2 pawn because now knight takes d4, c takes d4, the f2 pawn is hanging. Um, but I guess at the same time, Gunina was able to undouble her pawns, but so was Black. Yeah, and we're seeing mass series of exchanges here. Bishop f6 hits a rook and hits the pawn. She goes mm -hmm. rook g4, taking care of that immediately. That's a good retreating move. Now knight e4 is an idea. It looks to my eyes like a position that should be level, but we have an, a dynamic with a bishop versus a knight. That knight sometimes can hop around and cause some frustrations, and the bishop doesn't have any targets. So... I personally, at first glance, would prefer to have the knight, but I love this rook on f2, and I think that actually will cause white some issues here, especially if we can bring the second rook in to like a, the h2 square. Yeah, um, and that's what Humphy is going for here. So white can't do the same thing, and white is going to have to be defensive here. But at the same time, white doesn't have any serious weaknesses, and let's say that Humphy does get a rook on h2. After king c2, you can't force the king out of that square because you have a dark squared bishop if you ever attack the knight again she could defend it with her other rook at the same time if you start getting that passive black could start pushing her pawns and gunina might end up having problems later on so she's gonna have to find some kind of more active play here and that's a really illustrative example of that like if the king's on c2 and this rook's on d3 you're totally boxed in as white. Well. you can't really move mm -hmm. around at all so that would be a really sad defensive type of setup and that's what you want to avoid because some players are like, oh no, I can't sit passively. I have to go forward. And then their position collapses immediately because the best strategy was to sit back, relax, and just say, all right, it's not that bad. Other times you used to say, wait, if I just get into this position, I'm completely frozen and my pieces cannot move at all. And that's the case when this rook gets to h2 because even if the knight can legally move, 
it probably should not move with both rooks. Pigs in the on the seven. What's it called again? Pigs in pigs the blanket. In a blanket. Pigs in the blanket. There, there they are the again. There they are again. Yes. I, I like to think of this as like a lawnmower because you're just going right down the line there and mowing everything in your path. But we can go with the pigs on the pigs, pigs in the blanket, a little carnival food. There you um, go. It just is hard for white to move here. So I think that looks can be deceiving. And that first glance, oh, it should be what well, many people say. It should be a draw. King, uh, two rooks, four pawns, minor piece each. Oh, the, all symmetrical pawn structure, same side of the board. But it's a much more difficult position than immediately meets the eye. And I like that Gunina put her king on d3 because now her knight isn't going to be pinned. So she's less likely to fall for any of those knight traps where she realizes the knight is under attack too many times. She's playing knight f3, so she did find an active plan because her pawn on b2 is hanging. Of course, Humpy cannot take it because the rook on h2 is also under attack. So I like the way she's she's finding a way out. Yeah, they're actually, I'm going to show something very quickly because if the king were on b7, this would not have worked out so well for white. But the point is that your bishop d6, I would like you to take my rook so I could take yours, and then my rook would try to do damage on this uh, second rank here. A rook mm -hmm. g8 check would have been an important intermezzo so that you can take the rook next move once the king goes out the way. So the king being on the back rank was actually harmful for black's chances here. And then we see um, Humpy is trying to continue this game, but now she can get in trouble as this mm -hmm. knight is active and black is the one without any sort of clear plan. Right, but do you think there's actually some kind of dangerous plan white can go for here or they're just going to try a little bit and then i i know it's still a level game but i'm not sure what white could go for here i think the, the point now is this is d5 pawns and it actually played c6 look at the last two ranks for black it, mm -hmm. black was the one attacking on the second rank now look at the eighth and seventh ranks that black has to do with rookie seven was a really smart move is, is prudent just make sure you're not in too much trouble. But if white can double up her rooks on the sixth rank now, the c6 pawn's in trouble. So mm -hmm. the roles have reversed at this point, and white is the one putting all the pressure on black's position. Right. So Humpy is being defensive here, but she's going to need to be able to defend very well if she just moves her rooks back. But then it goes back to the question of once you start playing super defensively, you might actually get in trouble without even realizing it. For sure. And look, she's going to put a rook on d8. And now knight e5 is still a move that you should consider because this bishop on d6 really does not want to move mm -hmm. as the pawn on c6 would be hanging with check. So trying to distract this bishop, maybe b3, c4. She plays knight b4. Exactly the point. Please take my knight. Just do it. You won't regret it. And if you don't do it, knight a6 check is coming to distract the king away from the bishop. Ooh, so she just won a pawn. Humpy is under 20 seconds on the clock. It's crazy how quickly the tables turned from a position where Humpy was the one attacking to Gunina getting the lead, grabbing an extra pawn. And do you think that pawn and time situation is enough for Gunina to press a win? Yeah, I think actually White is going to win this game. And I would say that this position is a result of a psychological issue. Not that there's a problem with Humpy's thought process. It's just in this individual game, she mm -hmm. had a good position, so she was playing for winning. Oh, watch out for Rook G3 checkmate. Oh my gosh. No, but... Oh. Can she push beef? Is there... Oh, right, because she can't come back with her king. Um, okay, oh. her, her king can move over to B3 and try to come to A4, or she could sack with B5. She's going to put a Rook on G6. She's just going to be there. That's really smart. Ah, okay. I was like, <sighs> breathe, breathe, breathe. And now <laughs> this... Uh, rook h8 move you can play rook h6 which i think is smart and just continue making sure that the black rook can't give a checkmate and then at some point you'll have a seventh rank check of your own that's going to be hard for black to meet so she plays rook g7 first and then rook g3 i guess okay so she just tries to push the black king to be a little bit more passively but now she can't protect b2 anymore um she can get b6 and i guess a6 oh Oh, I thought I thought for a second Humpy was going to try to keep her in checks, but I guess it makes sense to just grab the pawns. And somehow White is up a pawn after all this. That was an interesting. Oh sequence. my gosh, she almost Humpy almost flagged. The clock oh. situation is pretty frightening here. Um, in a classical she, game, do you think this would be a, a theoretical draw? This is looking like it's close, but oh my gosh, she flagged her. 
there you go and that's why we like quick time controls well some of us like quick time controls others not so much you called it i think that honestly we both called elements of that game where you know it, humpy she was really playing for a win at that point she got into a worse position and gunina was ahead on the clock and was able to secure the full point because of it so that was a, a game that Hump, humpy really didn't have any business losing from a first i don't remember how many moves let's call it, first 30 plus moves of the game and then you get to that position you're like where's my win I'm, i should be better here and night f3 happens you're like oh wait mm -hmm. i have to lead the the attack I, I can't do that i need to continue it i'm down a point in the match i need to go for it so let's go to the other game between ifan and jean Saya because there is immense time trouble and oh no i saw that <sighs> I, I saw sarah's clock almost hit zero She's she's there between oh she's gonna flag, and the okay I didn't get a chance to evaluate because I was looking at the clock, um but it didn't look like she was lost. By no means it was actually in position with even material. White's mm -hmm. pawns are more fragile because c three f four and things like that were a bit of an issue. But White could have just played king to g three in this position and you're not losing. Right. You may end up losing the, losing the game, but in this position, you're certainly not lost by any stretch of the imagination. Fair enough. Okay, well, here we have um, so an Italian game with the bishop on the inside of the pawn structure. So I, I guess this is, according to chess.com, called the modern bishop's opening. Are you usually supposed to put your bishop outside of the pawn chain? Yeah, so I'm somebody who's played e4, e5 from the black side throughout my entire career. Mm -hmm. And I used to play some of these lines with a quick bishop e7. Depends on the game, depends on how I'm feeling. The thing about bishop e7 is it's very passive. The bishop is not a very strong piece at this point. However, when your bishop's on c5, it is more vulnerable to attack because white would play a b4 hitting this bishop or a d4 mm -hmm. with a tempo against the bishop. So that is why some players prefer to play this more solid setup where white doesn't gain any benefit from a quick pawn storm of sorts and that's why the bishop is stuck in here i don't like it really it's very passive but black will try to play for d5 and i think that so far in the opening white is very comfortable however down 20 seconds on the clock so yifan working her way slowly through the openings and start of this match mm -hmm. um and so she goes for d4 very quickly here and so let's say e takes d4 c takes d4 how does black decide what to do with this trade it seems very tempting to take it and give ho yi fan the center with the idea of now she has a target yeah i just it's one of those moves that you you sometimes regret not doing but you always regret doing as soon as you take on d4 you're like wait didn't i just hand my opponent two pawns in the center versus just one and more potential to push forward mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. sometimes you're like, I probably should have done that because if bishop comes to h5 and white goes g4 and black mm -hmm. has to go bishop g6 and you go d5 and keep it closed, here, right? Start of it. Right. Bishop on h5 isn't the happiest piece in the world. Yeah, this this looks... Honestly, both of Sarah's bishops are not having the time of their life right now. I mean, if the bishop has to go to g6, then you can't even play, and I, I, I mean, you can't play g6 right now in bishop g7 because you're taking away all of the light squares bishops. Sorry, all of the light squares from the bishop. Mm -hmm. So Sarah's difficulty here is going to be figuring out a way to actually get some activity for her pieces. Yeah, well, Zansaya, is, she's stuck, right? Her knight mm -hmm. is on e7 and wants to go to g6, but just like the pawn going to g6, your bishop on h5 gets trapped. And I like this move knight f1, because if you play g4 too soon, there will be sacrifices available to black, and you change the position from equal material yet passive to less material but very active. So that's why white has not played the move g4, as there would have been a sacrifice in that square. And mm -hmm. here is another example that g4, knight takes g4, pawn takes queen takes g4, check, and your knight on f3 is not defended enough thanks to the pressure here. Although actually knight g3 may be tactically okay because the bishop on h5 is also under attack. So I wouldn't be totally shocked mm -hmm. if Yifan plays g4. It just also is a risky move that both sides will be like, have the white king may become a bit vulnerable. By the way, Humpy just won a game. Oh, wow. Congratulations. So the score with, with Humpy and Gunina, is it then 2-1? Yes. Yes, it is. So can Hoi Fan try to 
prepared you for even more? Maybe a move like knight e3? You can play knight e3. The question becomes, can, what about c takes d5? Because black is trying to poke through a move like e4, and she plays bishop g5 like, for that explicit purpose, to take on f6 mm -hmm. and remove one of the attackers in the center. And what do you make of that decision, Alexander? Does white actually want to take on f6? It's tempting, right? Because you not only remove a defender, but you also create a new weakness in Black's kingside. At the same time, you finally liberate that bishop on f8. So, you know, there's some positives and also some drawbacks. Yeah, and to my eyes, it kind of reminds me of some Sicilians where you end up with these double pawns, like in the Sveshnikov, and you're okay with it because your king's not really getting under attack too quickly. And this dark square bishop is the lone one on the board. So knight to g3 played by Ifan. That is in the spirit of the position. Saying the material mm -hmm. to me is less important than the potential aggressive plans that I have here. And what ideally white would get is to remove this bishop, but not on g6. I don't want to take on g6 and give you a way to blunt my bishop on c2. I would prefer you take on e4 right now. So bishop e4 takes something like this, where now I have huge potential attack coming. My queen going over to h5, and that's exactly the type of thing that white wants, is an attack, despite being down a pawn, it's black's king that's far less safe. Yeah, um, and it's interesting because right off the bat, it doesn't look like black's king is in that much danger right now, just because intuitively, there's so many minor pieces nearby that could quickly hop into the defense. Yes, it feels like you have that defense you're saying, but d6 is hanging. She plays bishop g7. If you take on d6, bishop takes c2. You, your queen is distracted from protecting the d6 square. So right now you should take on g6 first, mm -hmm. then take on d6. And the problem with taking on g6 is not that it's a bad move, nothing of that sort. But then black takes h takes g6. I'm like, wait, I wanted to make use of the f5 square for my pieces, but now that you replace the bishop with a pawn over there, you're not getting a knight to f5. In fact, black is the one who would consider playing f5 herself, and then maybe e4, and opening up this dark square bishop on the long diagonal. Right. Okay, so if we're not going to take on g6, we can take on d6. Um, do you just try to protect your bishop on c2 so it's a threat? That doesn't work either, because then black can fix the problem by playing a move like d5. Yeah, white needs to operate in the now. You can't just think, oh, I would like to do this, that, and the other thing because you're down a pawn. And in addition to that, black is trying to push those pawns forward. Right. I think if I were playing this, I mean, I'm all close to a minute on the clock. I'm down on time. It seems easier to, I, I thought knight takes you six because you pointed it out to not l go for this kind of trade and then just recapture back the pawn. I suppose th this makes sense as well. Wait, no, it no. doesn't. It loses a piece. What? You, okay, you, that's why you have to take on g6 first. Sorry, for a second I thought both move orders worked. Wait. Sorry. Wait, we were just talking about this. How did this happen? Uh, yeah, she she blundered. She blundered. And obviously, and she she we see her face right now. She's like, uh, what what did I just do there? Because oh no, I'm way too strong to do something like that. Right? Yeah, I, I, do you think maybe she, she was looking at both options and she just played the wrong move order? I think so. It does happen right. plenty. There are famous examples of this where you you look at the game after mm -hmm. the fact and you're like, what in the world was happening? And yeah. then you realize that you just inverted the move order where you, like, you want to take first and then do something else second and you just didn't do that. Yeah, she looks miserable. I actually, it, it makes me sad to see her. Yeah, yeah. I, it, it um, it's not it's not nice to see um so i'm just gonna stop looking <laughs> okay so she's down a full piece here i think we're gonna see a resignation do you want to go over to the other game because the time is up so we're gonna not be able to catch it otherwise so let's go to the game between humpy conero and valentina gunina as it is at the moment two to one in favor of gunina but in this game here this is game four all right so uh, first i need to count pieces both sides have four minor pieces, check. Mm -hmm. Both sides have a rook, both sides have a queen, six pawns. Okay, totally even in terms of the material. But in the position, Alexandra, are you preferring white's coordination or black's? Um, let, let me think for a second. So both light squared bishops are on a pretty good square. I do have i did have a slight preference for white's dark square bishop it seems like now it's on the longest diagonal um 
a move like f6 to kick it off wouldn't make sense because the pawn on e6 would then be hanging. Okay, and that's exactly why Humpy is trying to trade it off. She plays bishop f6, so exactly what you were talking about, kicking the bishop off instead of playing f6, which you were like, nope, can't do that. Check that one off and mm -hmm. just throw it away. Now bishop f6 does the same thing, but offers a bishop exchange. So how do you feel like the bishop exchange works out here? Is white benefiting from this somehow or because some of the for example the c5 square that's one mm -hmm. that is more accessible and that's why knight came to b3 and maybe a5 or c5 so how do you weigh the pros and cons there yeah at first i was just thinking that humpy was trading off one of her minor pieces that wasn't as active as her opponent's equivalent but at the same time it was a good defensive piece i like that she's trying to go for knight c5 um I, I, I mean, that's why I prefer white's position, just slightly, though. So let's say the knight goes to c5. Can she try to just trade it off by putting one of her knights on d7 at some point? Yes, yeah, she then, can, mm -hmm. for sure. Uh, sorry to, to interrupt you there. No, I, I sometimes ask a question, and then I start answering it. I don't know why. It's, it's a little bit of a weird habit. Sorry, Robert. I do the same thing. We're on the same page here. Don't worry. And bishop takes on d5, and now Humpy's thinking about how to recapture because... She can take with the F knight, and she just mm -hmm. does that. And that's the, for sure what she was concerned about, is E4, gaining space for white. And we had a completely symmetrical pawn structure, but now white's gaining more space and trying to go to E5. By the way, Zansaya Abdul-Malik did win that game against uh, Yifan, where Yifan blundered the piece, so that even up the score there. And we're seeing if Humpy Canero can win this game and get this one into a tied match, although... Based on the current position in Alexandra, I do think that white is better both on the board and especially on the clock. Yeah. Um, that extra minute when she has a more active position is going to be extremely helpful. So she's she's putting pressure on the knight right now. Um, knight g6 looks like the natural move here just to also put a blockading piece in front of the queen. And I, I know it's wrong, but I would love to go for something like h4, h5 at some point. The problem is it's going to create a weakness in the long term. If you get into the end game, you really overextended your pawn. Um, but like, uh, you know, just dream a little bit. Rook c3, rook g3. Wait, I thought queen d7 now. Doesn't that pin the knight? And what's... Oh, man. Are we just coming and seeing all of the blunders? Uh, I was going to say that the knight on g6 is potentially vulnerable because of knight takes e6. But before I said it, I realized that queen d7 pinned the knight to the queen, in which case this knight cannot move. And if that's the situation, the queen takes e6 next for black scoops up material. And that is not ideal. By the way, if h4, h5 was wrong, I don't want to be right because that is exactly what I wanted to do to kick the knight out and give the king some love. So, right. It's one of those moves that always comes in, in rapid time control. But I, I have to kind of stop myself. I'm like, oh, it feels wrong. It feels wrong, but it looks so exciting. Um, either way, at least it would have not blundered a piece. But I will say this. I mean, playing a lot of Blitz online um, and not being as strong as these players and seeing that they also make mistakes is a little bit comforting, if that makes sense. It yeah. just, it's just, uh, you're like, I don't know if I agree with that. It just shows you that everybody's capable of making these mistakes and it doesn't mean that they're bad players. Oh, absolutely. What I was going to say was it makes you feel sad for them in the moment, but I think right. you're, the big picture is a very good one where even the best players, whether it's Magnus Carlsen, uh, Hikaru, whoever it may be, they do make mistakes. And it just, I think people often are very hard on themselves when it comes mm -hmm. to chess being like, oh, like, I'm not, I can't do this. I'm not capable. Like, you know, I'm making all these blunders. Then you see that even the best players in the world occasionally make slip ups that seem quite basic relative to their skills. It does happen. And rook to d1 played just now by Gunina. She's trying to actually play for the clock. Rook to d6 is an idea where you're hitting this queen. The knight on g6 is pinned, can't move because the g7 pawn is hanging with checkmate. The h5 pawn is under attack here. I feel like Gunina is doing everything right after dropping that piece. Yeah. I mean, it sounds really weird to say that because she's probably still going to end up losing but the right mentality is even if you blundered make it as tricky as possible and i'm, I'm glad she's doing that knight of four so where's that queen <gasps> going oh my to gosh go? queen g5 oh knight h3 check knight h3 and then knight f3 check oh Look my god tactic. robert that is beautiful or i guess here either way works yeah here it is i was just looking like oh queen g5 you trade queens black is chances haha <laughs> not trading queens 
thank you for the material. Oh, well, that, that was a really nice tactic to end on. Maybe Gunina can, okay, her face doesn't look like she's appreciating it right now. But of course, I know that chess players just have a serious face regardless of, of what they're feeling. <laughs> and she's still playing this out. I wonder if it's because Humpy just lost on time. So she's just saying, you know, let me see if I can mm -hmm. try to get a win on the clock here. Completely losing position, though. Yeah, I mean, she's has a knight for a queen. Um, I, I've been on this side of the pieces often, Robert. And let me tell you, unless your opponent has no increment, it usually doesn't work out your way. <laughs> I did see you smother checkmate somebody with that exact material imbalance. So I'm not counting Valentina to green out, but on a more serious note, of course, this game is pretty much over. And if this were a classical game, I'm sure Humpy would be a bit frustrated that the game hasn't been resigned. Mm -hmm. However, in this kind of blitz scenario, like does have plenty of time. However, there are a multitude of reasons that people plan just to get their frustrations out as they have yeah. another game in a few minutes. Uh, perhaps Robert, she isn't... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I just saw a comment and I, I wanted to not forget. I didn't mean to cut you off. Sorry about that. But before the game's over, who has a better chance at winning? Gunina versus Humpy or the one guy in chat who's just arguing with Mubot over and over? <laughs> um you know it's sad to say probably this person arguing with mubot it probably has a better chance. it's really a losing battle i have to admit but considering this game was just resigned this one is already over and i want to go do an instant replay of that knight fork because it was a really beautiful tactical uh, motif there where queen f6 was played to offer the queen exchange black is up a knight for a pawn exchanges should help her chances uh, Green says, no, let me take your pawn on h5. So now I have two pawns for the piece. That's closer to material equality, even though black sells extra material. And after knight f4, this queen is actually trapped because you don't have g4, you don't have f3, you don't have e2. Those knights are doing damage. Only way to save the queen, so she thought, was queen back to g5. And of course, she wouldn't have snagged the pawn if she realized her queen was getting uh, lost because knight f3 and knight h3, both are forks on the king and the queen. You sack one knight to get the other to scoop up that queen, and then it was all over from there. So, Alexandra, any sort of final thoughts about the five-minute portion before we take our break? We've seen quite a few blunders uh, this early on. The players, let's, I, I mean, so Hui Fan has been getting in quite a bit of time pressure, so I actually think Sara's playing very well so far. What is the score between them? One and a half, one and a half. Yeah, they're tied, and she's actually had better positions in the opening, so that's been surprising for me. And Gunina and hum Humpy also tied. Excited yeah. to see what's going to happen with them after. So am I. It was 2 no nothing in Gudina's favor. Humpia did strike back with two straight victories. And for Zansaya, she was the recipient of a blunder by Hoi Fan, but was playing a nice game before that anyway. So mm -hmm. with that, we're going to go to our break. And when we return, we will have the three-minute plus one-second increment portion of this Fide Chess.com Women's Speeches Championship Grand Prix.
and we return here with two even matches. The matchup between Hoyifan and Zamsaya Abdumalik is tied one and a half games apiece, and the matchup between Valentina Gunina and Humpi Canero is tied at two games apiece. So one extra game played in the uh, Gunina Conero match because the the way this works is when the match timer is up, there are no more games. But if the game is in progress, that game is allowed to finish. So Alexandra, as we head into the three plus one, who are the favorites in these matches? You tell me. All right. So we are heading in the three plus one for the second half of the players, correct? Uh, what do you mean a sec? Well, we're just uh, these matches. We're going to three plus one for the ones we've been covering. Oh, okay. Sorry. For a second, I misunderstood. Um, so a- as I mentioned, I'd like to see Hoi Fan being a little bit better with her time management. Um, I think Gunina has been playing a little bit more strongly um, in the game that she lost the second game. I felt that it was mostly because of the blunder. Um, and in the first game, she had actually outplayed Humpy a little bit. But, you know, they're still very close. So I'm curious to see what's going to happen there. But Gunina really needs to win to make it into the Super Final. So she is playing her absolute hardest. Yeah, these uh, players really have a lot to go for here. For Gunina, she is currently tied atop the leaderboard with Ana Ushanina. But depending on how many points she scores in this match, she mm-hmm. may lose out on tie breaks because the first tie break and this is number of Grand Prix legs one. Gunina has won one, as has Ushanina. But then the mm-hmm. second tiebreak is total points, game points, won throughout the whole event. So Gunina need at least six points today to secure a spot in the uh, Super Final, no matter how she does in the match. If she wins the match, she's through. If she scores over mm-hmm. six points, she's also through. It's complicated, but that's what the standings are, and that's what I have to report to you. All right. Well, I'm looking at the Jensaya and Hoi Fan game, and... Looking over here, Jensaya just castled after pushing her pawn to g4. Is her king actually safe there? It's a good question. Is that a king that needs to be highlighted in red or highlighted in green saying it's safe? h5 is trying to take direct advantage of the fact that the pawn is on g4. I don't really like this position for white. I don't think the king is getting mated just yet, but the entire structure looks a bit odd. The rook on mm-hmm. c pins this knight on c2, on c3, excuse me to the pawn on c2. It makes it hard to move. And she took on h5, which is typically not a move you want to play in a position like this. I'm thinking even rook c5, rook c5 takes h5. She goes for the more natural rook takes h5. Alexandra, you seemed quizzical and saying, wait, this doesn't look right. Do you think that white has chances here? I mean, what's going on? It's a confusing position because both kings have their own weaknesses on one end hoi fans king is in the center of the board but she actually has more pawns protecting the king than white's king on g1 um and when you are you're asking about chances i'm trying to figure out well what can white try to do and and create weaknesses and i don't see anything right away i mean e5 to try to open up the position is not going to work because she just plays d5 can Hoi Fan just leave her king there and try to develop her bishop, take her queen out, and basically take advantage of the semi-open G file? I think so. I would think of a move like queen to G5 or rook to G5 was played. And now there's even threats of rook takes G2. That is a mm-hmm. thematic exchange sacrifice because once you take on G2, look at the promise of your bishop on B7. So right now, moves that come to mind are rook takes g2 and the queen. That's what I would do. I know it's not my pieces, so I'm happy to sacrifice mm-hmm. them. But I think this is actually good and not just me being myself. Rook takes g2, king takes g2, and then drop that queen into h4, hitting e4, putting pressure on this exposed king. I'm all here. I'm all in. I'm here for it. Okay. I guess the thing to me that is intimidating about that is, let's say, rook takes g2, king takes g2, queen g5, king h2. The rook is coming to g1, and black doesn't have that many pieces to continue the attack with, which is, you know, at least the basic principle I've stuck to since I've been a kid. If you're going to sacrifice your pieces for a kingside attack, make sure you have enough backup. Gosh, let me sacrifice other people's pieces in peace, Alexandra. Come on. I just want to give up stuff and go for checkmate. But you are correct that if you feel like you don't have enough pieces uh, in the Mm -hmm. action there, then it probably will backfire. And so instead, she plays the move. She went um, 
e knight f6 and e5 and brought her knight out to try to get to f4 and this is a very good strategy for black because you have given up no material whatsoever you still have attacking possibilities although i really like this move bishop f3 by jean Saya because now she can play rook to g1 and try to trade off this aggressive rook on g6 Okay, so that's actually a pretty good idea because the rook on f1 isn't actually doing very much. So she, that was an interesting decision by Ho Fan. I guess she didn't want to def... she didn't want to put her knight back, so she actually didn't have a choice. So it was an interesting decision. It was forced. Okay, moving on. So now is Ho Fan's king actually the one in trouble? Somehow the position really changed, and again she's in time pressure. Yeah, I don't think it's her king being in trouble so much. Oh. Okay, maybe her king is in trouble. That was a really nice move because the bishop on b7 is under attack. And so you have to take on f3. And once you take on f3, I take on f6. And that's big trouble. What a tactic there by Zansaya. And the point is that you're ripping the position mm -hmm. open and she just decided to give up a piece because otherwise... Oh, is it queen d7? No, because bishop takes c8. Queen d7, and there's also queen takes f3, but bishop takes c8. Right, and to, and to slow that down, so you were saying queen d7 to threaten checkmate on h3, but there's bishop takes c8, which actually protects the pawn on h3. So that's why she goes for h4, which also puts pressure on f2. Yeah, and but, queen takes f3 was very precise, just oh protecting no. both. So she's down a full piece now. She is. And rook g4, another good move, kicking this queen off of h4, and now white is up that full piece that you talked about and mm -hmm. king to g2 just to sure up your king side i guess it's pretty early in the three plus one uh time segment but i would have considered resigning just to see if i can get more games in this time patrol however ifan playing on it's hard to resign isn't it yeah it it is hard to resign i think when you made it i don't think that was an e5 would you consider that how ifan blundered into that or just I don't know what the right word is for what just happened. Yeah, she overlooked it for sure. Bishop overlooked, f6 right. was a really natural type of move, but I guess mm -hmm. king f8 or g6 or something that was just working better because of this e5 tactic. And, well, we're at the live board as I'm catching back up. And, okay, actually, wait, this knight is kind of trapped over here. c4 might fall. So Interesting. It's not nearly as easy as I initially thought. I guess c5 is probably a pretty good move here. It should be winning for white, objectively. But in blitz games, anything can happen. Although white is the one up a lot of time in addition to being ahead in the board. So this should be relatively smooth. Right. I mean, of course, there, there's still a chance, as you mentioned, she might hang a piece. With a knight and a bishop, accidentally, maybe if you're leaving them on the same file, you can get them pinned. But That's true. She also has that extra H pawn. I think there's just too much going on here. Hoey fan resigned. Yikes. Tough day in the office. Um, wow. Yeah. It's uh, it's just, when we talk about it from the start, if Zonsaya can play very quickly, it seems mm -hmm. like Yifan is spending a little bit too much time in the opening stages, which doesn't leave her with enough time in a position as she overlooked that move to E5. It's a tactic that she certainly is aware of those possibilities. Mm -hmm. And yet, she just didn't find it there. And hold up. I'm just trying to... What <laughs> happened? No, the other match, they, <laughs> they had to cancel a game there because they were playing five-minute time control. They just were rematching each other. In okay. Five yeah, I was looking at that too, and I thought maybe we were staggering the starts of the game or something. <laughs> no. All right. No, that, that's good to know. That's good to know. Um, okay, so... Hoi Fen, um, this is similar to a game they, they played today already with the Bishop E7 line in the Royal Lopez. As you mentioned, it's a little bit more passive. And Hoi Fan didn't get a good position last time she tried it, but I'm curious to see how she's trying to improve it this time, which she already has. It's yeah, less close. It's less close. That Bishop on the light squares was a problem for her in the past. It's, this is all thematic. It's all opening theory. The knight comes to b4 to pester this bishop. Watch out for a3. It would have trapped mm -hmm. the knight. That's why black put a5 to give the knight some space. So Alexandra, when you look at a position like this, it's pretty obscure, I would say, for mm -hmm. those who don't play the Spanish. However, having had the black side of this position uh, several times, I know that it looks okay for black, but I've always felt myself uncomfortable in this position. 
And the weirdest thing for me is what do you do with that bishop on e7? On e7? Yeah, yeah, the, the dark squared bishop. bishop. Yeah, the dark squared bishop on no, e7. That's, that's a pawn. Oh, okay. I see where you're going with that. Okay. Um, no, but it, truly, it does feel awkward. And I feel like the only play you kind of go for here, since the position is so close and you don't want to make a pawn break on f5, is the open files. That's true. And the open C file, open A file, it's all, all the actions on the queen side. But if you t put all your tension over there from Black's point of view, and then a knight F5 type move happens, you can be in big trouble. Like if knight H4, knight mm -hmm. F5, something of that nature, you have to really look out for that. So right now, this knight came back to C7. It allows some trades in the A file. Black may stop on A4. So that's like, please take me on A4 and I'll take with my B pawn, which becomes a passed A pawn. So there are ideas for both sides here to um, kind of open up the position. But right now, it still remains relatively closed, despite the fact that there are two open files on the queen side. Right. And she plays rook a4, so the plan is quite straightforward. She's trying to double up. If you play rook takes a4, b takes a4, then both sides are going to have pass pawns. Does either side have the advantage after that trade? If white can push b5 and b6 quickly, then white will have the advantage. If you can't do that, then you don't have it. So that's why queen b2 was played, just to bring the queen closer to what would have been this past a pawn, as you pointed out. And now if you take on a4, black can even just take back with the rook and say, eh, I don't even want to have to calculate white pushing that pawn forward. So instead, uh, knight to d2, this knight may come to b3, and then into a5. And that's a good regrouping. And... Alexandra, I have to ask you, what is Black going to do about this clutter of pieces? That's, they're not bad at all, but I'm wondering about these four minor pieces that seem to be kind of stepping on each other's toes to some extent. This is what I don't like about Black's position, and it reminds me of some positions I get in the King's Indian as Black, where, I mean, okay, actually the computer analysis hates the King's Indian, so <laughs> it also says it's bad, but it's supposed to be theoretically okay, but when you actually sit and have to figure out the plans, it takes longer than it should, and it's really awkward to figure out a way out. So yeah, 98, very common idea. I mean, you're opening up your bishop, potentially the f-pawn, and obviously you have to protect the knight on c7, but now your knight is super passive. I really don't like this style of position as black. Yeah, bishop b6 is trying to take advantage of that. Okay, queen a2 does not hang a piece, because after queen takes a2, rook takes a2, the knight on mm -hmm. d2 is under attack, but that knight may go to b3 and into a5. However, black has freed up some of her pieces. So by tr offering a trade of the queens like this, uh, you're able to counter attack mm -hmm. and take control of not just the a file, but also some of the ranks, the a3 square in the third rank, the a2 square in the second rank. So it is interesting moment here for Yifan. How is she going to respond to this queen a2 move? Right. So... Whenever your opponent offers a trade, you got some options. You can take, you can leave it there, you can move away. She decides to take, and now she's going to have to deal with the knight. So she put it on b1. I guess this way you could hop to c3 in the future and look towards the b5 pawn. Um, rook a1 does pin the knight to the rook, but it's not that strong of a move because the light squared bishop is protecting the knight. So the rook isn't actually tied to defending. Um, That's a, I actually really like how you did that because... It's exactly how your thought process should work. Rook a1 looks like such a natural move pinning, mm -hmm. but the knight on c7 was under attack. And once you realize the bishop on d3 is protecting this knight on b1, you're like, all right, I have to take care of my knight on c7 first, but I'm still looking at rook a1 possibilities later. Oh, mm -hmm. later, never happening because knight to c3 is played by e5. Okay, and now it looks like there's a pawn hanging on b4, um, but there's also a pawn hanging on b5. So do we want to just go for any kind of massive exchanges here. I guess if bishop takes b5, there's rook takes c3. And the point of that is you are securing two rooks, excuse mm -hmm. me, two, <laughs> two rooks, two minor pieces for a rook. And that kind of imbalance is difficult to assess typically. And mm -hmm. look at this. Both sides have very awkward coordination or lack thereof of their pieces. This knight on a6, bishop a5. I mean, this knight on c3 cannot move because the bishop on d3 is hanging behind it. Now the knight came to c7 to protect b5, but then I'm looking at the c7 square in the open c file. Alexandra, I cannot work through all of this. It's giving me a bit of a, a headache. Like, what are the sides playing for at this point? Well, they're both around 30 seconds on the clock here, and... 
that is really troublesome because you need more time than that to figure out a plan in a position like this. Um, yeah, maybe I need like 30 days. It's <laughs> such a weirdly complex position. The G6 pad, let the F5. I see Black's plans actually much more readily than I see White's. Um, I think Chad is having a hard time understanding this position as well. I see quite a, peop a few people putting way too dank when they're just overwhelmed with the amount of information there is here. But it's a very complicated position. So now we're going to be looking at the clock. That's something that everybody can understand. Um, and this is, I think, where we're going to see one side maybe push a little bit too much to get any kind of play. And it's either going to work or probably create some kind of weakness because they don't have time to think. Yeah, for uh, for black right now, rook a3 hits the bishop on d3. She moves the bishop back. Now knight f6 is tempting to my... Ooh, check on e4. I typically don't like capturing on e4. And it gives the knight this great square. As you said, a king's Indian. This is what this reminds me of. And now we trade and rook c6 is coming. And b5 is hanging. Bishop takes b5 right now and just wins the game. And so, so that's exactly what happened. Um, Jensaya was the one who pushed, but she didn't do so... In an, an, in an accurate way. And as soon as she tried to create any kind of advantage in her position, Yifan just punished her. And now rookie seven. Yeah, this is up two pawns for Yifan. She is, I think you can't move really as black. You can't protect this knight on E8 because the rook can't go to B8. The bishop on E5 is doing it all. It's really weird for me watching these kinds of games because as somebody who plays a lot of three minutes, it makes me think that if you're ever in a position like that, what you should do is almost nothing, like small changes to your position because you don't have enough time to go for something forcing. And usually the person who does it, it's easier to react and find the flaw in what they did. We're going to switch games really quickly to the Humpy Canero versus Valentina mm -hmm. Brina game. They have Oh, yeah, before it ends. Seconds. Good call, and Robert. Black is up a pawn with threatening queen to b2. Check me. Now, queen to c3. That just looks... King c1 only move. That way your king uh -oh. to c2. Right, because there was two checkmates threatened, B2 and A1. So there was no way to defend them both other than to try to run. Um, but now now that king is being chased, while Humpy's king is very nice and comfortable on A7. Yeah, this is a problem for Gunia for sure. Bishop G5, but getting rid of one of the defensive pieces. Actually, Queen B1 was checkmate in one. She missed that. She pre-moved H6, G5. But after the bishop left E3, there was immediately a checkmate in the position. We'll look at this after... Oh, wait a second. C7 is under attack. Okay, queen d4 check. Oh, no. Touch. She has to keep checking. Otherwise, rook takes c7 is mate. Yeah. I think oh, it, my gosh. This is now going to peter out into a draw. Oh, my. Oof. Let's go back to she the She had 10 though. seconds. Do you think she should be pre-moving there? Do you recommend no. pre-moving with 10 seconds? No, and bishop takes g5, opened up the e-file, so when queen b1 check happens, it's not just a check, it's a mate. The king mm -hmm. lost its escape score on e2 thanks to the opening of the e-file. So that was actually a great play by Koneru, and unfortunately for her, she didn't uh, stop. She pre-moved h6, g5. She has lost the game on time, so I understand why she would be pre-moving, and it's tough to play with 10 seconds on the clock. I'm just looking for the checkmate because that's where my mind's at. Like, oh, let me play aggressively. She's like, wait a second. I have to look at the clock. I have to make sure my king doesn't get into a perpetual check. It is much easier to say moves and then walk them back than to play them because it can't take them back. So I completely understand what just happened here. It just is a missed opportunity that she likely will regret, especially as Gunina is a point ahead right now. Right. Well, uh, do you want to stick to their second game since we haven't um, seen as much of theirs For as sure. we did with Hoi Fan? Okay, cool. So she has, Gunina has that knight on e4, and it looks like a really strong, menacing knight. She also has backup with her knight on f6. In exchange, though, Humpy has the two bishop pairs. They're both fianchettoed, meaning that they're on the longest diagonal on the board. Do you have any preference for either side here? It depends on the time control. I would say in a classical game, I would prefer to have white position. In mm -hmm. a blitz game, especially look at the clocks right now, by the way, I would prefer mm -hmm. to have black's position. And part of it is psychological. That we hear this notion a lot, right? the two bishops advantage. What does that mean? Well, one side has the bishop pair, as Alexandra has been pointing out. The white has bishops on both colors, and black has a pair of knights instead. And this is a relatively closed position. So knights often work better in closed positions because bishop needs space to operate with, whereas knights can hop over. Like knight, this knight can come to g4 and mm -hmm. hop over the pawn. And opening up the a-file 
seems like a good idea, but then why would this rook on a1 come to d1? The rook will have to come back to a1 to try to go to a7. So right now, I'm not as worried. And look at that move, knight g4. Watch out for tactics with knight takes f2, knight takes e3 kind of stuff. I, I just prefer black's position. It's dynamic. And with this kind of dynamism, it feels like black does have the better chances. Yeah, that's actually a very interesting point. I wouldn't have thought of it like that. Um, actually, I, I probably would have looked at the clock situation too. And now that Gunina is up a minute on the clock, that's quite a lot. She's already placed her, her knights on their ideal squares. Now she's going for G5. Interesting. So she's actually trying to trade off the bishop pair and create some light square weaknesses near White's king. And that's one of the drawbacks of having a bishop versus a knight. Mm -hmm. If we see the light square bishop and the knight traded off, that means you have a lone dark square bishop against a knight that can hop from color to color. And we say this very regularly, that mm -hmm. in an open position, the bishops as long range pieces are the dominant force. However, in certain positions where there are potentially vulnerable squares, in this case, light squares, that's what the side with the knights is trying to take advantage of. Okay, and it's interesting how much it changes um, having, let's say, um, a knight and a bishop versus the bishop pair versus just a knight versus a bishop. Right. It's because those two bishops work so well together here. And e5, so now Gunina is threatening to play e4, which is going to either force the knight back or onto the side or into a trade. So none of those options are too great. Um, you can't stop it with e4. But I guess, actually, I guess you could put the knight on d4. That's true, right? So e4 would be a very committal move for black because the knight gets into mm -hmm. d4, although that gives the e5 square to the knight on g4. It's one of those moves where you don't want to give up such an important square, but there are some benefits. And knight h4, trying to play knight takes f5 here, Alexandra, as the knight on g4 lacks defense. That's exactly why bishop c8 was played, to give the knight on g4 a second defender. It seems a little superficial, though. Isn't her knight going to get stuck on an awkward square? Yes. Because the pawn is just defended now. And I was wondering if she's trying to play f3 to boot this knight and even try to play for f4 later. But you can't really play for f4. She plays for c5 in the style of the, mm -hmm. uh, well, it's a Queen's Indian. I would say the King's Indian. It's kind of the same vibe. We're trying to sacrifice a pawn to break open the position. As we keep talking about, white has the bishop pair. Open space should benefit her chances. All right. Well, we're going to get even more of an imbalance here so gunina now has a pass pawn on the b file but the pawn on c7 is now a backwards pawn and the position is opening up a bit which is advantageous for humphy because she might actually be able to use her bishop pair at some point exactly and she plays rook to c6 which means that this other rook can try to go to c1 i what do you make of this though the black is up a pawn because of the sacrifice so if you were trying to evaluate and not just in computer numbers that's not what we're here to do in sort of like human assessment how do you evaluate a material deficit for control of squares um i guess i would first see how likely am i to win the pawn back um from the white side of the pieces and it seems like it's not for sure you could double your rooks on the c file but you're not certainly getting that pawn back um I guess she says, hang on. Spoke too <laughs> oh, no, soon. I spoke too soon. Okay. Well, it wasn't for sure until that tactic was missed. And it's insane that Gunina is the one who let her have this opportunity, even though she has a minute to her, her 17 seconds. Yeah. And, well, Gunina still has a good chance because knight f3 check is actually a really annoying thing to me. I would take this knight on f3 mm -hmm. and then play queen, anything about queen e6 check, trying to trade the queens off because. Queen oh, to get the pawn on c7 after? But yeah. you're opening up the light squared bishop on b7. I don't know about that. Yeah, you're probably right, actually. I was, I was hoping that my pass pawn would be good enough, but just giving black that opportunity to say, hey, my bishop looks good, whereas right now it looks terrible behind this e4, d5 configuration. So right. instead, it, It's just so satisfying to give your opponent's bishops a bad time and be like, yeah, that's such a nice active minor piece, but you're doing nothing with it versus the b2 bishop, which is at least putting pressure on e5. Uh oh, c7 is hanging and yeah. e5. Oh, nice. That's a good pawn to capture because f2 would have been lost if you took on c7. I was like shaking my head back and forth trying to figure out what was happening here. That was the right pawn to take. You don't give black any sort of counter chances. And if mm -hmm. you look at the clock here, 17 seconds of counting down for black and only 10 seconds for white. 
All right. Well, they're both in time pressure now, but Humpy is up two pawns now. Um, she still has to be a little bit careful. I guess the best chance for Black would be... Oh, exactly. okay. It was check. It was check. <laughs> okay. There, there's no bishop hanging there. All right. Well, opposite side... Opposite colored bishops, we always talk about how they're drosh, but with three pawns and, um, you know, three of them pass, this is definitely winning. Yeah, it's kind of like four pawns because black has this lone B pawn, which is stopped mm -hmm. by just the bishop. And as you see here, there are four white pawns just pushing up the board. This B, I played B2 at some point, just hope that Humpy is pre-moving. All right, she resigns. The game mm -hmm. is completely objectively lost. That was it. Was well done by Humpy. A timely c5, crashing through in the c file, giving up material to get uh, back more later. That was a well played game. Yeah, it really was. So Humpy has tied it up. Um, do you want to jump quickly to the Hoi Fun game because they're a little bit more in the later stages? There, uh, Hoi Fun has three and a half to two and a half. So it seems like she won the last game. And I actually like her position a lot here. Um, she's the one attacking black on the king side. There's a semi-open F file. She has her rooks doubled there already. Um, all of her pieces are really ready to hop into the attack. Even the bishop on C2, which is, I guess, technically blocked by two of her pawns, she can open up. Okay, and she just does with D4 to eventually put some pressure on the king on H7, maybe even create some pin ideas. I guess the next question is you have this nice position you got the center your pieces are developed um how do you make sure you don't lose this advantage i mean your pieces are perfectly placed all of them there's yes. not a single bad piece for white I, it's true it's a dream position but sometimes in dream positions i feel like you're just so happy and if you play too slowly maybe your opponent can also put her pieces on their dream position so where would those dream squares be and i'm not saying that to you know be combative i just no no, no. That, that's a good point you're the point you're making is sure but even if we play slowly there's just not as good squares for the black pieces which is a fair point i mean knight c4 would be great so she has to block it probably with with b3 to not trade off the bishop pair there i've highlighted all the pieces that i like for white in the position and i, I don't know if you see that it's like <laughs> all of them like, okay yeah. wow it feels a little bit bad to be the other pieces you know <laughs> and it just it's such a nice position for white. You're kind of coordinated as best as possible, but you, you raise a good point that when you have a position like this, it can be frustrating if you don't see the quote unquote winning move. It's like, right. I know my position. I, I'm a hundred percent sure my position is excellent here. Like look at black's last move, rook to B7. What does that do? And she plays knight H4, trying to get rook takes F7. Maybe the, wait, rook take, oh, the knight G3 was hanging. So that was cheeky. But e5, now rook f7 is even stronger as g6 is hanging after it. Bishop came to e6, and now there's no d5 for white. It, ah. White is now prepared. So all of white's pieces are actually pointing towards the king now. Um, like how can F7. she continue here? Rook takes, rook takes f7. Do it. And if bishop takes? Rook takes f7. Oh, queen takes and you take on g6. Okay, that's a very nice tactic. And it's what's happening. I feel good oh, about this one. That, that was a nice one. That was a nice one. Nice job, Robert. And I guess, so after you win the queen... The knight on a5 is also hanging. Okay, that's important because actually, if the knight wasn't hanging, um, then what is the compensation? Two rooks for, for a queen and a knight. So mm -hmm. she has to take the queen back, uh, the, the knight back, sorry. But then it's, it's still... It could still be tricky... You don't seem like you really believe that. You're like, it could be tricky, except for the fact that the black king is on g6. If you could put the king back on h7 and a pawn on g6, I'd probably buy that. But yeah. When, ooh, she was queen c2 going She doesn't for even take the knight. There must be some kind of mating attack she's going for here. Yeah, I mean, I, I assume that she must have calculated something because otherwise, even the fact that she won a queen, um, you know, if the black king was safe and you can, you know, put this piece material somewhere else on the board, it's actually maybe even better for black. Yeah, just full board awareness by Yifan. You know, yes. To take on F7, realizing the G6 pawn at the end would get uh, black's queen. And well, that's but, like an but the A6. point is, sorry, yeah, sorry, now take on A6. But, but the point is, it's actually 
super impressive that she's figuring this out because I, I didn't see like a checkmate continuation. I saw that she could win the night, but she's still going to have to play against two rooks. Yeah, her king is safe for the time being, and she's just mopping up all the pawns. And this is yeah. just, she's up four pawns. So it's a queen for two rooks, which depending on the position, let's just call it mm-hmm. uh, usually better for the two rooks if the king is safe, but the king is not safe. And so exactly, black resigns. That was so impressive. That was a really, really impressive tactic. And she played it with such speed and confidence. Oh, wow. I, I really enjoyed it. That was, I mean, that, that was a great game. I'm actually mm-hmm. going to save that game. Give me a second. So Yeah, e- sounds good. Both so we can show it later and so I can save that for my files of like awesome tactics where you just pressure and asking the question that you asked, Hey, how do I make progress from here? It looks good, but how do I turn that into a victory? So that was cool. Okay, well, uh, let's go to the Gunina and Humpy game because they are tied. Um, Both players are under a minute on the clock. Pieces are even. Opposite side castling. Black's pieces are a little bit more active because the Rook and the Queen are on the open file. And there's a semi-open file on... um, the white's king but not on black's king so definitely humpy is a little bit better here slightly up on time but is it enough to push for a win we'll find out um (laughs) i find it so funny every time we watch humpy um they they look at her fan and they put coggers in the chat (laughs) i honestly wish i had a fan like that that was above my head because it can get very hot here and rook to e1 speaking of heat trying to get a checkmating attack on a1 where the queen on f6 is on a fully open diagonal and wait rook to e3 queen goes to d5 <laughs> look what you've done i see what I, you're I don't doing. i don't know why the emote is so funny i don't know um okay so rook e3 uh the queen is going to d5 as you mentioned it's a nice central square that you know might eventually get a back rank check could come back to the defense still tripling up with the rooks Rookie one coming now. And I guess she just has to sit after rookie one or any of these. Does she, cause, oh no, she can't sit because if she sits, can you play rook takes D2 and then bring your rook to E1? So what oh, the is, she attacked the rook. She atta- attacked the rook. Makes sense. So now if rook D2, this queen takes D2, trying to trade the queens off. So she puts a rook in one. Wait, rook D1 barely getting away with this. Oh my gosh, rookie two. So this is a defensive rook takes h2. You're going to steal a pawn. And that's the bad thing about white's position. Not only is there danger of getting checkmated, but your pawns are all under attack. And okay. I, like, I like what Kunina did there, though. She's just giving some checks and just creating problems. Humpy's clock. Five seconds, 12 seconds. We've seen Humpy flag before. Hopefully she doesn't do it this time. Okay, she's attacking the rook, which is protecting. And if the rook goes to g2, then I think there was rook h1, which was going to lead to checkmate. So Humpy just stole another pawn. Ooh, what do you think of the rook trade? Was that a good call on her part? I think that it was very smart for Humpy because uh, now she can just push her H pawn unopposed. The A5 pawn, though, if this is about to be a race. Oh, my gosh. So queen G3, please take me. That helps me promote. And I guess black is just winning the race. H3, H2. Black's king is very safe. There are not going to be too many checks. And push him, baby. Where's Yasser Sarawan when you need him? Right. And, uh, you know, Gunina is really trying to find some checks here. But even if she plays something like queen f5, um, I'm guessing it was just queen g6 and the queen could just block Oh my gosh, check. she made that move with 0.1 seconds left, by the way. And now Humpy oh. wins by time. Oh my gosh. Wow, so Humpy takes the lead after a bad start, which is even more impressive. So it seems like the lower time control has been helping Humpy. Yeah, let's go to the game between uh, Jansaya and Yifan mm-hmm. here as they are in the midst of a two-rook endgame where White is up a pawn. So White needs his victory. She's down a point in the match, and she's up a point in terms of chess value on the board right now. What do you mm-hmm. make of this? Do you think that White's winning chances are higher than Black's drawing chances? Um, I... I guess it's a blitz game. I have to remind myself it's a blitz game. But no, because she's playing against a knight. And I feel like knights are really tricky. The pawn on e4 is an isolated pawn, so it's probably going to fall. I I think black has pretty decent drawing chances here. 
you know what I'm looking at, which I always do. Bishop on dark squares, a8 is a light square. They do not match. So when mm -hmm. we note that white is up a pawn, you should think about ways that you can, as from the black side of this position, the ways that you can make your position as manageable as possible. And what are ways to do that? Well, winning back a pawn is a pretty good start here. Rook c4 now. Mm -hmm. I actually don't really know what just happened because you gave a pawn and then rook c4, which would open up the b file for this rook on b7. Although you do kind of give a clear path as a pawn. I think rook c4 is good. She plays it. All right. So I guess one of the drawbacks here is that she has to make sure that she could defend her c4 pawn eventually. But as you mentioned, um, probably if white is b busy attacking that pawn, black will be able to grab the other b pawn. 48 seconds for white here. Rook takes c4 is going to lose b2, but she's going to have that past a pawn. What side would you prefer to play here? Pass pawn and bishop or knight and connected I've pawns? Yeah, the, I prefer to have Black's position because I don't think that pawn's getting very far. And if mm -hmm. this bishop ever leaves g3, there's either knight e1 or knight f4 type of ideas going after the g2 pawn, which is on a light square. And I like what Yifan's doing. She's trying to play h4. There are actually mating nets that you have to be careful about as well. So we see an exchange on h4. And now I prefer white's position. So see how quickly that changes. Uh, I think Black is totally fine, honestly. Rook a2. Right. So... Can does either either side have any other tricks to try and get something more than a draw, or that's about how the game's going to end here? Probably just going to be a draw, like Rook B one check and then Knight E five, threatening Knight to G four. That's a trick that you need to be careful about. So Ifan, I wonder if she's sort of playing for a win at this point. It kind of feels like it. However, objectively, the position is totally fine for White and shouldn't be. Uh, too big of a risk. 91 now. That's what she's probably going to do. Right. And again, 20 seconds with the black piece, with the white pieces here. Um, so she does have, you know, higher chances of blundering. But Ho Yi Fan is taking her time. So after 95, so she's trying to get her knight to g4. If bishop takes e5, though, isn't that just fine for white? Yes. And it's just completely uh, level position. Although I guess if this black king comes in f4 and then pawn to e4, I could see how White gets scared and makes mm -hmm. a mistake here because Ho Yifan Rook... declined a draw, by the way. Well, I, I understand it. Black's Rook is behind the pass one, stopping him, and Rook takes a five now. Rook takes a five, and then Rook e five to then... help mm -hmm. her pawn. Oh wow! Because now, or now her Rook is the king. The... She can't play Rook e five because if you trade, is White no? Black yeah. Wins. White... Yeah, okay, black can promote. Black can promote. Okay, so you can't take the rook. And here comes e2. Oh my gosh. And then king e3, king f2 type of stuff. Or king f4 threatens rook h5 checkmate. That's actually a really sneaky move. King f4 threatened the queen and the checkmate. This is also uh, good, but that other maneuver looked even better. Wow. And this is a very common idea you have in uh, rook and pawn endgames. One thing that your opponent always tries to do is keep your kings in check. So you have to use the one piece you got to block them. And she did that beautifully. Wow, what a what an endgame. That's why I never and... call games drawn. I, I just won't do it. This is Now it's completely winning, of course, and I call this drawn. But I, even if the material is completely level, I, I sensed that Yifan was playing for a win. Speaking of, do you think players should ever offer draws in positions like that? I don't like draw offers, but uh, in general. Mm -hmm. And offering a draw, she probably was nervous at her clock. She just wanted to split the point, but you find, let's just go back for a quick second before we take a break. Mm -hmm. This position, right? I think the chess players in us are like, wait, what? This looks, I mean, it looks, looks fine. Right. You note know that once this pawn came to a5 and the rook came to a2, bishop went to c7. The bishop is away from the king. And knight e5 was played by Yifan after a 14-second thing, saying, look at this endgame. It still is a draw. It should definitely be a draw. But black's rook is in a prime location behind white's pass pawn and cutting off white's king at the same time. So that's a rook that's doing the most. And as we saw the game continue, that this king came to f4, and Yifan said, it's not about the pawn 
quantity. It's about the quality. And my pawn is a quick passer here. And this is all she needed. Rook e5. Just want to show white. The rooks couldn't be traded. As after king g3, there was king to e4. And unfortunately for white, your king has to step aside. And then you can't stop my e pawn from pushing. So your king has to go to some square. It doesn't matter where. And yeah. then the e2. And, and just to slow you down, king e4 is a critical move there. Um, that's what I was calculating. Because if you just push the pawn, then white can actually catch it. So you do have to see that very important in-between move when you're even thinking about playing rook e5. That's true, right? And you're fortunate for black king d4 also wins because your king will come to d3 and help you push mm -hmm. the pawn. But you're totally right that you can't just trade and hope that your pawn is quicker because it is more advanced. You have to calculate it through, and Ifan did that. So mm -hmm. let's go to a break now. We will return with the bullet portion of these women's speeches championship yeah! matches when we return. And as we return here, we get to the bullet portion of things here. And one thing of note, Alexandra, is that Valentina Gunina is playing for her super final life because at the end of the Grand Prix, the top two finishers make it to the super final. And Gunina needs to win this match at this point. She needed to get at least six points or winning the match is enough. That gets her through. She's down four and a half to three and a half. Do you think that there's just so much more pressure on her and that should play into Humpy's favor? There's certainly more pressure on her. And the shorter the time control, the more she's been seemingly having difficulty with the games. 
And I think it's a little bit similar also for Ho Yi Fan, who has been needing a lot more time. So maybe actually Humpy is going to have the advantage in the bullet portion as well as if we're looking... Um, sorry. Uh, Jinzai is also going to have the advantage there. Got it. I was like, I was going to try to fill in the blank. I didn't know where you're going with it, and I, you know, that I mean, I'd be there for you if I could have. I just, I yeah, I, I, I had a moment where my, where my mind blank. Sorry about that. Sorry. No, about I, that. it happens to me plenty where I'm like about to finish a thought, and then I'm like moving on to another thought or just a little jumbled. So I, I think that Yvonne, she's up enough in the match where she will convert this and she'll win the match. Whereas I think we should stick for. Humpy versus Gunina, that's where our attention will be because that's a one-point match and Gunina is playing for a chance to make it into the Super Final. If she wins this match, she is officially through as one of the two players to the Super Final and the rest of the players are trying to catch up to Ana Ushanina. So let's look at this game here. We see a Bishop B4 check, Knight B to D2. So Alexander, what do you think about the opening choice by Humpy? Uh, I was actually on the Hoi Fan game, but I'm here now. Okay, so... I, I, I like playing these kinds of openings as white. I guess the question is how much experience does she have in them? I'm going to yep clock you for a second because Humpy is now down 10 seconds in the early going. Mm -hmm. Right. So it seems like maybe she's not as familiar with these openings if she took so long. And, and you're right. When you look at it, it was like uh, four seconds, five seconds, two seconds. So usually in a bullet game, if you're not making the move in less than two seconds, you're actually not that familiar, which seems weird to say, wow, three seconds is so long to make a move. But I mean, you know, you got 60 seconds and one second increment for the entire game. So it truly is. Just look at the situation right now. It's double the time for Gunina. And what's frustrating Humpy and she plays D5, this Bishop on B7 staring all the way through mm -hmm. the pawns, right? You know, you see the, the trees through the forest and down at the... Is it a forest through the trees or whatever? You get the point. The pawn on G2 mm -hmm. is what this bishop is trying to attack. And so can she just start removing the center? F takes E4, E takes D5, chisel away and get that bishop to see the light of day. Oh, wow. That was very beautiful. Almost like a poem, Robert. Um, and she has been able to do it, but interesting. So she doesn't take on D5, which I thought would be tempting because then white would have had an isolated pawn. She instead closes the position with the idea of recapturing the pawn, sorry, capturing the pawn on C4 and then later capturing on D5. Yeah, I thought she was going to capture an F5 for sure. That also caught me off guard, but she wanted to get after the C pawn. And look at the bishop on B7. Now black is the one who's up a pawn here and the bishop is great. So knight g5 is what I would play for Humpy, just to try to get a queen b3 check if the queen leaves mm -hmm. a diagonal. And if the queen goes up to d5, it's the threatening mate on g2, a good multi-purpose move to save the queen. 11 seconds versus 43. I think this is going to be Gunina's game. She's attacking. She's up on time. Humpy defending very well with knight e4. Should, wh why did Gunina trade her rooks? Because she was worried about rook c7. She did not want to give Humpy any activity when there was a potential of a mating attack. And this queen can come to c7 now. And actually, I think that Humpy's doing everything right. Oh, no, that b6 pawn was important. Okay, she, she made her first blunder here. Um, so now we have equal pawns. White has a pass pawn. Um, both kings are pretty in, in a pretty similar position. Ooh, wow, queen that is trade. I don't like that choice. That's an outside pass pawn. Right. And the white king is closer to black's pass pawns than the other way around. And knight e2 would not be a good move, which is why she didn't play it, because there would have been d3. So instead, the knight just comes in e4. Oh, man. She's going to win, because if the bishop takes the knight, then you could promote the b pawn. Otherwise, the knight's taking on d6. You can't defend it, and it's protecting e7. the only square that the pawn can go to. Yeah, oh exactly. Oh, my gosh. I mean, Gunina was the one who was outplaying her at so much more time. And that's the problem in Bullet, is you feel this pressure every single move to play like instantly. But there, of course, are times where you should actually sit and think for a little bit, resign immediately, and go to the next game. Gunina, she does that. Right, She's because only... it's a matter of, you can play more games, right? Right. She's only down two points, so she does have enough time if she wins the next couple of games. But that is just a tragic end to what was such a promising game by Gunina. Well, do you want to stay on Gunina's game since she's playing for, for the Super Final or check out Ho Yifan as well? Well, Yifan just won the game, so she's already at four points. I think that match is over, so we should probably mm -hmm. stay here. Okay, I, I think that's very reasonable. So we got a Queen's Gambit 
from Gunina. Um, Humpy is playing very solid openings. Um, and I, I think she's playing them because she can go for them very quickly. It's funny, though. I feel like this line in particular is it's misleading. It seems so straightforward, so simple. But then there are moments where you're not sure, like, do I trade a pair of pieces? Do I, you know, where do I put my rooks on D8 or C8 or both? Obviously, is the ideal. And rook A to C8 for Humpy is what I would play pretty quickly. And we saw a position like this, uh, but it wasn't exactly this one. And here, F3 plays. Is that trying to get the bishop to F2 and pawn to E4? Like, it just feels like there's more bite to the position that immediately meets the eye. And look at the clock once again, Alexandra. Just 35 seconds to 59. Humpy is down on time again, but she was better in the time scramble last game than Gunina. So I don't know what to think. Um, we'll see if it's a pattern or if it was just one game slip here. And now the queen is a little bit more active on the queen side, which is very helpful because close positions are harder to come up with plans. That's true. And the queen dropped back to b6. Here comes the bishop to f2. Wait, at some point, rook takes d1 might be a problem because the pawn on b2 is under attack. So I'm starting to like Black's position a lot. And once again, Gunina is like doing things a little bit too quickly. I think she's actually okay for the moment. It just feels like Black is perfectly coordinated and maybe bishop c4 and rook to d2 coming. Okay, um, knight d3 trying to trade off that bishop. Can white keep her bishop, just move it over to g3? Well, then she's going to lose the... Actually, she's not losing the b2 pawn. Okay, knight d4 attacking. She went for the trade. Still looks good for black from a on-the-board perspective, but from a clock situation, I mean, Gunina is up so much time. And I don't like e5 at all because that gives... So the much time, like 20 seconds max. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry. It, it's just so funny in the context of things. Okay, she, she's taking a lot of time because she doesn't want to allow rook d2 in. No, she does not. And that, I guess rook d2 is really threatening with the e3 pawn fight, and so the knight went to f5. And I want to somehow level a checkmating attack. I don't see the way to do it. She was knight to e2. Mm -hmm. I played bishop f8 if I were Humpy. I just need to protect... Ooh, she was h5. Okay, some serious aggression there. Um, but I, I'm pretty uncomfortable because rook d2 is coming at some point. But okay, let's make sure there's no checkmates on black's king first. Like after queen h6, queen g7. Oh, the knight's hanging. Just kidding. And rook c8 is a big threat. Okay, so she was bishop mm -hmm. c5. Now, there's no... Th threat immediately for black that i see if rook takes c5 and queen takes f6 is possible but you need to play for winning four seconds left i think you could take on c5 at some point <gasps> oh my gosh you won on time humpy oh. no the flag back to haunter oh my gosh and gunina she just kept the pressure up i think we both thought that humpy's position was good but her clock management continues to be an issue in the bullet yeah, it really has been. Uh, oh, boy. Okay, so Humpy is playing a similar opening. They're they're retrying it here. It seems like they both prepared with bullet. Queen takes d2 um, so that she could put her bishop on b2 on the long diagonal there. Yeah, I, I like how you pause there. We're like, wait, queen takes d2 because for most people, they would have the same reaction. Like, Don't you tell me not to put a queen in front of a bishop. That's because the bishop's better diagonal is from the b2 square as we saw in an earlier game just trying to open up the position however it takes a while to open up the position up and humpy is spending a while on here while gunina moves instantly mm -hmm. alexandra i'll let turn this over to you in one quick second i want to point out that gunina can make a draw if she does so within the next two minutes because she will get one more game after that okay uh, wait, so when you said she can make a draw, you mean like she's okay with having a draw? She's not going to lose the match because she's down by one point. Got it. Okay, that's how much time. Noted. Precisely. So what do you make of this position? To my eyes, it feels like white objectively is better, but... I mean, we think? talked about this, right? Didn't you say how in, in quick time controls it's easier to play with the two knights? I, I, I stand by it. I just thought that maybe you want to argue with me. Uh, I, I think that's a fair point, but now the bishop's going to be traded off, and I do like Gunina's position because white's king... I, I mean, technically, the black king is also not safe because we have a pawn on g5, but I like that black has the attacking chances. In bullet, I think it's much more intuitive to attack and harder to defend. Well, now that f5 pawn was lost, this is looking actually quite bad for black. That was a very important decision by Gunina. She took on d5, and that was incorrect as queen takes f5 threatens the g5 pawn the bishop and the queen operating very well for a potential attack 
And if Gunina loses this, she can't win this match anymore because she only has time for one more game. That is, and she might not even have enough time because right now there's only 50 seconds on the match clock. And if Humpy is smart, she can just play this out. Like just, you know, she's up a pawn. Just yeah. play it out. Oh, oh, wow. I'm starting to worry a little bit for Humpy because look at these pawns. Black is down a pawn, but these pawns are kind of quick over here. Okay. Um, and, and why is Humpy pressing so much? I guess if you don't press and you play too passively playing for a draw, you often end up losing. Okay. So she's putting her rook back on D1. It's going to have to come to C1 at some point. Just get on that promotion square. Oh, she's losing A5. Just go A5, B4. And she should, oh. and Gunia should have done it earlier. Oh no. King D3 now. Oh, she had to go A5, B4 and protect the pawn. What she, she she's playing a little too quickly in those critical moments because it's so hard to tell when they're coming. Oh no! And now she's she's gonna have one pawn versus three. I mean, there's no way she can win this. She's actually gonna be the one fighting for a draw. And time is up. So she, her she uh, she botched this one here. Yeah, she did. Uh, that was that was tough to see it finally felt like she had chances and it was a need to win situation. So Humpy can even just try to go for a draw here. There's nowhere the black King can go and she wins the match. Oh, she's ambitious. I guess. She's... Rook G3. Okay. She goes Rook G6. This is actually, I'm a little nervous based on how Humpy's clock management has been in the previous right, well, game. I, I was surprised she didn't go for a draw right away, but it seems like she, she realized that it made most sense. Oh, are there, how much longer do they have? Nope. It's over. It's over. Okay. It's over. This will not count, which means that actually we officially, if I'm not mistaken, if my math is, is correct, we officially have one of the participants set for the super final that will be on Ushanina. She, with Gunina's loss, I think she's trails Ushanina by one point in total game points. And that sends Ushanina through to the super final. Got it. Wow. That's heartbreaking. Yeah, because Gunina was playing so well, and she fought until the very last game. That's tough. That's tough. She had so much pressure, and you know, sometimes it, it's not your day. It happens to everyone. And it honestly felt like it almost was um, Gunina's day, and something just went wrong there in the bullet. She had three good games. I mean, that, that last game was not a good game at first, but then she actually somehow outplayed Humpy, and couldn't convert when she needed to. Yeah, that's that's exactly what ended up happening. I'm I'm, I'm curious. I want to see Gunina's bullet. So I mean, her her bullet is twenty five fifty. Her highest was twenty six thirty nine, um, and Humpy's bullet was twenty four fifty three. Her highest twenty five forty one. So she was higher rated in bullet both at their peak and their current rating. And I mean, Gunina is known as a speed demon and you saw that on full display where she was up on the clock every single game. And that's the tough part when you play bullet, you're just in this mindset, you have to play instantly every move, but there are moments when you just need to like breathe. And it's hard to do. It's much easier for me to say that than to actually do it when I play my own bullet games, but just to take a step, say, Hey, I have a little bit of time. Let me take a breather. And well, this is a perfect segue because Alexandra, you and I are going to take a breather because the next set of matches are going to begin in a couple of minutes. We'll be back shortly with the other quarterfinal matchups in the Women's Speeches Championship.
And as we return, we get set for Anna Muzichuk taking on Sara Sadak, Kadem al and Harika Dronavali playing against Alexandra Kostenyuk. Well, Alexandra, I guess I know that you're probably rooting for the person named Alexandra, or is that too confusing? I, I, I'm a commentator. Am I allowed to root for anybody, Robert? Uh, you can root for me. That well, works. I, I always do, Robert. I always do. Oh. Okay, I'm going to flip the question. What are your predictions for this match? Okay, I'm going Kostenyuk because she seems like she's in really good form and she's played extremely well throughout the WSCC thus far. And that's, of course, taking nothing away from Harika Jandavali, who beat Tatsu Abrahamian by one point yesterday. It was The final score was closer than I actually remembered it being, but it was a good match uh, on Harika's part. And then as we look at Anna Muzichuk and Sara, oh gosh, I don't know how to pick that one. I think that... Sara has proven to be very strong, has made it to every single semifinal thus far. She's made the two semifinals. So on that front, I want to say Sara, but Anna Musiak is super duper strong. And mm, I don't know, Alexander, you pick that one for me, please. Just do it. Help me out. Help a guy out. Oh, I, I think we should just talk about their different strengths and weaknesses and maybe not necessarily predict that one. Okay, oh, that feels oh, like a okay. cop out. I'm so going to get roasted in chat for that. You, you deserve it because I just, you know, went out with my first pick. I was just like full steam ahead. And then you just said, ah, like, I'll maybe think about it and we can talk about the strengths and weaknesses and you know, figure out who's the better player. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly that's what we're gonna do and looks like the game started so no more times for predictions robert where do you want to start you play dodgeball uh i played in elementary school yeah real good at dodging real good at it so i just wanted to check in to see thank you i was it. actually quite competitive i'd always make it to the last three people dodgeball is actually so fun but also because if anybody would would upset me in class i would try so hard to to hit that person with a ball and it was allowed, so, you know, why not? All right, well, now I feel like I shouldn't get on your bad side because then you're going to bully me. What, I'll hit you with a softball and you'll feel a little slap? I think Wait. you can handle it, Robert. I mean, dodgeballs can be really – anyway, let's talk about the chess before I get into a full conversation <laughs> about dodgeball. And when I look at this position, Sara played this in previous matches. It looks really shady, honestly, this opening. Your knight's on A5. You haven't developed fully on the king side. Your king's in the center. But somehow this is an, an acceptable approach that Sara has relied on in the past. So when you see this position, Alexandra, like what do you make of it? Because to my eyes, it really looks obscure. Yeah, I don't like it. And, and usually the openings that look obscure or odd, they're probably not the best opening, but it might be one where Anna Muzichuk is really comfortable with it. And sometimes that's more important. I mean, C4 followed by B3 is what to trap this bishop on A2. So we've seen sad bishops throughout today. Uh, we saw that game with, between Zonsai and Yifan. And that's something that I'm worried about. So I'd probably take on B4 if I were Anna and just click. Ooh. So C4. Right. Yeah, I, I thought C takes B4 made a lot of sense as well. But if she played bishop E3, she might must have some counter idea here, right? So maybe... Well, if she moves the knight, her bishop is trapped, so it can't be that. Maybe bishop d4 instead, since she just played bishop e3. So she ends or... up just giving away the piece. I can't really think that was totally intentional, but I see compensation for her in the form of this terrible knight on b7 and two pawns for the piece. It's not full compensation, though. It can't be. Honestly, that was kind of confusing. Um... Yeah, no, she, she didn't get enough compensation. She has two pawns for a piece. Two of those pawns are doubled. And even if they aren't doubled, that's usually never the right way to do it because even just having one extra minor piece is so helpful at grabbing pawns that she's not going to be able to keep them both. The one downside I would say about Sara's position is knight on b7 and the knight on e7. Like, you don't really have clear-cut plans for these mm -hmm. pieces. And the knight on e7 is sort of stuck because this pawn e4, the knight on b7 doesn't have anywhere useful to go just yet. I would consider playing a5 to get my knight to c5, or trying to get d5 to happen. I, that, that move just is really hard to see happening with so many white pieces staring there. Yeah, that that's fair enough. So b5, she's at least trying to fix her pawn structure. Um, but So a takes b5. Let's say she takes with a knight. That seems pretty intuitive. Then she'd also be putting pressure on d6. 
I think it's queen of B3. And this feels like Black's pieces are just free-flowing. And you are up a piece for just two pawns that aren't menacing yet. It's a position that Sara needs to be careful in. But mm -hmm. ultimately, I think she's able to... Oh, she took on C3. Speaking of needing to be careful, when you give up that Fiend Keto Bishop, your king side has some vulnerable dark squares. True. Um, I, so she wanted... She thought that knight was a really good defensive piece, so she wanted to get rid of it. And I guess also, if white would have recaptured, she could have doubled up her rooks on the open file. So she decides to save the knight because a takes b7 would have also forked the two rooks. And True. now she can recapture the bishop. And then there's knight takes e4, right? just stealing this pawn in the center. And black's king, you can't just attack with one piece. Mm -hmm. You have one dark square bishop, great. Put it on h6, put it on d4. You're not checkmating me. My knight's coming to f5. Now, this is just a clearly advantageous position for black. Although, with this outside pawn, if you can get into a7 and get your rooks to the b file, you have some hopes of surviving. It just seems like a... It's just so hard to believe. I mean, white has terrible pawn structure. Two hanging pawns. I guess they're also pass pawns, but with an extra piece, you're going to be able to gobble them up. Um... Rook c6 now. Very precise move. Yeah. And you're winning this a6 pawn by fours. If rook did d7, you have king to f7. And you're just winning this a6 pawn. If it goes to a7, you have rook to a6, and then you take the pawn anyway. So this was really well done there by Sarge, just liquidating into a winning position. And unfortunately for Anna Muzichuk, her first game is not one that she wants to uh, remember. Right. Do you want to take a look then at... Um the Kostinuk and Harika game. Let's do it. Let's switch on over to the other matchup. And whoa, okay, we have even material, a very weird pawn structure where Black has a pawn E7 still. You don't see that very often. So Alexandra, your first take on this position here. Um, I would call it a level position where even though the material is equal, there's some asymmetry here. So the White King is a little bit more active. The rook on g2 is more active than white's rooks. Um, Kostinuk is also up one minute on the clock, and she's really good at squeezing something out of endgames, even when there's not something there right away. Looks like her position is easier to play. The rook on g2 more active. The one good thing for white is the king on e3. For now, it actually can be in some danger, but having the active king in the endgame is, generally speaking, a good thing. And I'm worried about white's position because i'm looking at e5 which says this knight on h3 is useless and then bringing the knight to e6 and there are actually plenty of mating nets that the white king has to be alert for with his knight trying to come to f4 eventually right um and okay so what are the most dangerous mating nets here so if i can get e5 and I'll just put this on the board just to force it. It's so like, if mm -hmm. I can get my knight to e6 and then to f4, this knight is stuck. Let's say knight f4, your knight can't move because rook e2 is checkmate. Right. And so that's the mating that you need. And, and then you can bring this other rook down to g3. It's just like, white can't really do anything or attack anything, and black can tie white's pieces down. I don't think that that exact line will happen, but Kostenyuk did start with e5, which is a step in the right direction. Yeah, and I... Okay, so she's trading off the rooks here. Um, now, white's pieces are being super passive. The knight's stuck on h3 defending. The rook on h1 is at least going to trade off the other rook there, and now we'll be able to hop onto the other side of the board. Knight f2 seems tempting because then you're cutting off the rook from coming to e2, and you're getting your knight off of the file. Um, can the knight go anywhere else from there, though? Knight d3, for example. Rook e2 checkmate. Yep. I was just checking on you, Robert. <laughs> You're just checking to see if it still worked. It does still work. Confirmed that the knight is now stuck here because rook e2 checkmate is the plan. And white has nothing to attack. You can play rook a1, try to go rook a8, and then, you know, okay, now, now the d4 score is also juicy. This c4 move is so committal here. I actually just want to play 96 to d4 and throw in the f3 pawn. So go from a meeting net into attacking a pawn. Right, and, and that's what you often see. I, I guess both in attacks and endgame, you did you had one kind of threat for the checkmate that caused white to be passive, and now as a result, you can go for something different. 
instead she decides to play king d6 so it's an end game she's trying to activate her king but does that give rook d1 with any tempo there i guess the rook has to be careful because if it ever leaves the h file then rook h2 is going to be a threat later on and i'm willing to give up this pawn on h4 so i would play rook to d1 and try to go rook to d6 i need some kind of a counterplay i mm -hmm. can't just sit and do nothing at least that's how i feel maybe the computer says hey what's your what's your problem just go rook a1 rook b1 rook h1 and do that whole thing and actually the rook h2 you can actually play rook h1 Okay, well, rook g6 instead um, to defend against your idea with rook d6. And she, yeah, so she would have had knight g2 check winning the h4 pawn. So look at that was so clever. Oh, I'm impressed by that. She went, brought her rook to g3, but gained the move by dropping the rook back. And now right. she wins the h4 pawn while attacking f3. That was so sneaky. I, I, yeah, that was really impressive. And now knight takes f3. The knight comes into d4, blacks up a pawn. Mm hmm. And she's up a minute and a half on the clock. That's a massive time lead. Alexander Kostenyuk is a wonder. I mean, she just really has been playing so well. Yesterday, there was one of her games uh, that she, against Bibi Sara that I was like, wait, it looks like white should be okay. And then she just pushed all of her pieces forward and they were you know, working together perfectly. And now in this position, this knight on d4 up a pawn, this b4 pawn is stuck and probably about to be lost. I probably don't want to give up the f6 pawn, but you can even give that one up by playing rook to b3. She instead protects it. I mean, Alex, I was just saying Alexandra, and then I saw the name on the screen. I'm like, am I just reading her name or am I talking to you? Seems like Castanio is in really good form to start the day. She is in good form, but here she's only up a pawn. So she has a couple ideas to move forward and one of them is playing f5 so that she creates a pass pawn and that's something you often see when you have an extra pawn you try to trade off any other pawns that are blocking your path to a pass pawn um, and now she's also putting pressure on b4 on top of that so can she just take b4 right away I guess she doesn't want to give up c6 because too many pawn trains that would allow white to try to sacrifice her knight for the remaining pawns so the more pawns you have the less likely it is that harika will be able to sacrifice her her piece and now rook g4 check and then i'm going to try to use my e pawn okay rook f5 also this knight on h3 it, this knight never was able to, never was able to get active it was never able to coordinate well with the rook and so Black has just been pressing forward in this entire endgame, despite the even pieces at the start of this. Right. And now E3 makes a lot of sense. She's continuing to push her past pawn. White is trying to keep Kostinuk in checks or just gain time because she has increment. Um, but you, you can't just promote so easily. You have to make sure your pieces are coordinated. Knight C2 is now putting a defender on the promoting square so that the rook can never go to E1 and block E2, E1. But the knight can. Nice. Yeah, this is just... So e2? Maybe there's some tactic here. Uh, you have to be careful because if you... Mm -hmm. you know, e2 looks good. You're threatening just to queen down here. Um, e2, and then if white would have taken the rook, you would take on f1 and promote. Makes a lot of sense. Although there were some... Yeah, some, I guess some interesting tactics there. It looked like it worked, but probably she sees better here. She's still completely winning. e2 actually would have won because if the king went to d2 there was knight f3 check mm -hmm. the fork and the king is just entering anyway yeah knight knight d1 so honestly harika is doing a really good job defending this with five seconds she's closed the time gap as well it's still a very tough position but i i don't think she could have done a better job at defending given the circumstances i agree and she wants to play knight f3 and transition into a king and pawning game but that would not have been winning i do not believe so instead, she put her knight back to f5. Now her rook's on h2, cutting off the king. And here, rook d2 check. And I think you can just march your king in, king e4, getting out of the pin. Good. Oh, she can't go king d4 because knight f3 check. Okay, but now she can play king g3, king f2. And she's bringing her king. Yeah, no, your, there you your go. maneuver was also very good there. Just helping... Bring supportive pieces here. Okay, now she can finally push. Uh, or I, I, okay, this is cleaner. This is even cleaner than what I was thinking. Yeah, she didn't want to give up the c6 pawn, so she just does this trade, and now she gets a queen and she wins this game. That was, 
I mean, it was interesting because there were moments where we're like, wait, is she actually going to convert this? It's looking like Harika's putting up stubborn defense. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, Kostenyuk had the advantage and was in control pretty much from the entire time we tuned into this game. So a deserved win for Kostenyuk. And that was only the first game, but it took over 13 minutes. Wow. Um, and, and so how long do they have per time format again? So it's 30 minutes, and it's good to remind all of our viewers of this, 30 minutes of five plus one. Then we get 30 minutes of a three plus one. That's three minutes plus one second increment time mm-hmm. control. And then finally, we have 10 minutes of one plus one bullet chest. Got it. Okay. So I'm checking back on Sarah and Anna. Um, okay. We can take a look at their game as well. They're a little bit further along. All right. Let's switch games over to uh, that matchup between Anna Muzichuk and uh, Sarah here. We see that, whoa. We're definitely further along, and this bishop on g2 looks brilliant. Yeah, I really like Sara's position here. She's not up anything yet, but she has the more active pieces and the bishop pair. It looks like she's going to force a knight trade, or is, is the b5 pawn just hanging as well? Yes. And a2, a3 will be protected after knight takes b5. Yeah, that seems like the better option here. Just gobble up that pawn. It's funny because my initial thought was the same as yours. Like, oh, knight takes c6. I, I'm left with a good bishop against a knight that doesn't have any clear outpost. Mm-hmm. And she just takes the pawn instead, which ultimately we both agree is better. I had the same exact thought as you. Of like, oh, let me just trade pieces. Okay. Um, so she did get that extra pawn. She has the extra pawn on the king side. It's a four versus three there. The black king is also in a worse position. Um, so in terms of trying to prioritize a winning plan here as white, do you try to attack the black king or go for some kind of winning material on the queen side? What would you try to do? It feels like both the weak king and the fact that this queen on c5 has nowhere really to go exactly. I mean, it kind of feels like all elements are good for white, but that's distracting. And I honestly feel like I'm looking at this position – it should be so good because I look from piece to piece. The queen on a1 is excellent. It's hitting all, the entire diagonal. The bishop mm-hmm. on g2 is the best minor piece on the board. The rook on d6 and the rook on c1 are more active than black's rooks collectively. And now that we're about to see a queen trade where queen takes e5, knight takes e5, and then maybe just knight to c7. It's like, nah, no space for your pieces. I'm uh, perfectly happy to enter this queenless position where I'm up a pawn and my pieces are still... Uh, harmoniously operating wow sarah looks so cool calm and collected she she should be and for anna i I don't think she can really afford to drop this game and she has chances to hold this only one extra pawn as pieces start getting traded off alexandra we talk about this quite often that in rook end games rook and pawn games one pawn plenty of times it's not enough to win the game that's fair um so she's gonna need a little bit more than that the time is now equal, so rook rook c5 and then bringing the knights to also put pressure on a5 looks like a good attempt. Hmm. And she moved her knight back to b5 because she didn't want the knights to get pinned with rook to c8, so that's just something to point out. And I want to say that if the queenside pawns get traded, when you think about which material you want to come off, black would like to keep the rooks on the board, white would like to get into a knight endgame. Mm-hmm. Because, so a, a okay. knight endgame, if the rooks were traded off, would that be winning for white? Usually it is. And with rooks, it's a theoretical draw. I know that for certain. That if the mm-hmm. knights came off the board right now, this is a theoretical draw. If the rooks came off the board, there actually are a ton of winning chances for white. It's very hard to play. And oftentimes, it's actually just with proper play, we'll be winning inside with the extra pawn. It, it's looking okay. I mean, Sarah's repeating some moves because she's low on time, so probably not that she's playing for a draw, just that it's hard to find a winning strategy here. But Anna's not going to let her trade off rooks, and I don't see a way she can force it. She cannot. And if you ever play f3, in comes the black rook to the second rank, so it's going to take some serious time here from Sara to be able to press for a win. And here's finally f3 is played, and mm-hmm. e5, e6 is so tempting, she goes for it. Ooh, e6 does look great here. And now yep. she can be putting pressure on the g6 pawn. Mm-hmm. And you're looking at the base pawn. Like Black's pawn on g6. She trades. So I was telling you, these knight endgames 
often have winning tendencies. Here, I don't think so, though. With that pawn, those pawns already traded, I actually think that's a bad thing for white. Having that one more pawn was good. Okay, well, let's see if she can do anything. Of course, if the knights are off, this is winning for white. What are the tricks here for white to try to win? We, we finally got the rooks off the board. I don't really see any with this king on f5. It's perfectly placed here, protecting the g6 pawn. And if the knight ever moves away, the king can even get into g4. So Anna, I think, is going to hold this game. Right. And basically, if she keeps her knight on e5 and tries to bring the king to attack g6, then her g3 pawn would be hanging because the black knight would put pressure on it. So that game was a draw by repetition. What a hold from Anna Muzichuk there. I mean, she just didn't allow Sara to get the winning configuration, uh, one of them that we were speaking about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so now we are... Do you want to check out now the Kostinuk game since they're further along? Yeah, let's switch games over to that one. That one's really interesting, actually. So, Alexandra, since you had first glance here, what are you making of this position between Kostinuk and Harika? Okay, well, Harika's king is in kind of a funny-looking position, but she's the one who's actually attacking on the king side here. Um, I prefer Harika's light-squared bishop to Kostinuk's bishop for now, just because it has a lot more control over the position. Um, the question for me, though, is... Actually, the bishop and the queen are pointing towards the queen side. So now that the king side is blocked up, maybe that's what she should go for. I prefer black. That's my overall opinion so far. Completely with you. It's, it's funny when you see a king on g7 like that, you're like, wait, isn't this not really the safest king? But white's king is in more danger. And that's why uh, Kostinik went f3 and had the pawn h3 to stop g4. And I liked your idea to go to the queen side, maybe with queen a3 there to put pressure on a2. Because if you trade too many pieces, you may not have enough from Black's point of view to play for a win. And so knight c4 here for white is the untangling move that I think is necessary. And as long as you can avoid sacrifices on h3 or g2, it feels like white's chances of holding this game are only improving. Yeah, that, that feels fair. So you think Kostinyuk, um, do you think she real she probably realizes her position is a little bit worse? Does her plan then shift to trying to hold? Or do you think it's hard to get away from that I want to win mindset? I think that black can just play for a win forever with no risk. And it's because there's a knight in f4, bishop on c4. This is the clearest example we've seen of how mm -hmm. a knight dominates a bishop. This bishop on c4 cannot possibly attack this knight in f4. The d file, the only open file, is under black's control here. You can even play queen to d1 and exchange queens, and then bring the black king from f8 to e7. Look at all of black's pawn. Dark squares, that's a light square bishop. Every single black piece, except now pawn c6, was in the dark squares. Alexander, this feels like it's going to be a model example of good knight versus bishop without anything to attack. I mean, those games are always super instructive, so that's not the worst thing that's going to happen. And also, Harika, if she wins, then she'll be tied so far. Um, and, and their games have been taking a lot of time. Although, I guess they'll have time to start their third game before the time is up. That's true. We have what, eight and a half minutes left in this time control, so yeah, they almost certainly will have time for another game unless this game goes like 200 moves, which is possible. In a closed position like this, it sounds like I was being facetious. No, in a closed mm -hmm. position, sometimes you just move your king around a bunch, and then you offer a queen trade, and then you move a pawn here and there. So, okay, B4. What? Because uh, then, I'm not going to just wait around here. I'm going to try to open up the board for my pieces. Yeah, and, and it makes sense. Um, Kostinyuk, if she is trying to hold a draw, she'll try to get some counterattack here, because otherwise she's just going to get slowly rolled. B takes A5, B takes A5. She finally opened the file for her rook but her rook also kind of has to be tied to defending that g2 square because otherwise there's rook d2 bishop f1 um i, I guess bishop f1 kind of helps Oof, g3 so trying to exchange the weakness from g2 and turning into a weakness on h3 here and oh that's a good move rook c1 this is actually looking really bad for white true I mean, it's been looking bad for white for some time now, but I guess the correct way to say it then is Harika has just been seriously playing well with her advantage, just converting it to something slightly more and more, which is how you win games, right? Here comes King H5, King H4, King G3, by the way. That's what, that's what Black's going to do. Just play for a checkmate. True. <laughs> it's a oh, I just, I just thought of a weird question. 
What's up? So most most computers would be able to beat another computer if they're like in a plus one or like plus two position, right? Mm-hmm. But doesn't that almost mean then that like being plus two is actually like plus infinity because you just keep converting that advantage to a bigger and bigger number or like the, the limit is reach, reaching infinity in point value? If the engines could see that far, then I guess. And I don't know how we got into these deep philosophical. Sorry, I, I, was like, I, I don't think that even makes any sense. I'm sorry. Let's go back to the commentary. Okay, uh, chat is is either question marking, or okay. Honestly, so, that that was a really like I would love to have this conversation with you when we're not covering speed chess. Yeah, absolutely. Because, I'm sorry. Let's let's go back to it. No reason to apologize. Don't be so Canadian on me. <laughs> oh no, because because the point is like Kostin Yuk has been playing her best game, her her best play the entire game, but she just had, you know, uh. A slight disadvantage earlier and it's just rolling into something bigger and bigger so that's why i was thinking about it because it was relevant to this game that being said let's go back here um okay so 30 30 seconds on both sides and i wonder if actually she's close to holding this at this point because she's trying to sacrifice her b pawn to win the a pawn and yes the g4 pawn is probably going to be lost but there are times we've talked about this just down one pawn in a rook end game you still have good chances to hold Okay, so so oh my gosh. And here it is, the F6 pawn being a weakness. But isn't okay, I'm I'm not the expert in, in rook and pawn endgames, and I'm not gonna pretend I am, but whenever the king is in front of the pawns that want to get promoted, doesn't and it's in the center of the board, doesn't that give white really good drawing chances? Yes. No, white is actually I think objectively drawing this game right now. King E2, King E3, just play this back and forth. And if the king, the black king moves, you can't go to f4 because you have the f6 pawns hanging and they made a draw because there was nowhere for black to make progress from. The rook would have just kept on the sixth rank. And mm -hmm. if you traded off a pair of pawns, rook and one pawn versus a rook in that position with the king in front of it is a draw. Okay. I never like these positions for white. Um, it feels like... Oh, I, I'm still on the chess queen um, and Harika game. It feels like whenever you trade off queens, you're basically giving your advantage back. Um, I, I, what, what do you think of this choice? She she just wants to get into an end game here. Yeah, I think she wants to avoid the Botes gamut at all costs. So by getting rid <laughs> of the queens on move four, that way you don't have to worry about it. On a more serious note, and not taking shots at my my co commentator here is that why just say i have a bit more space if you look at the pawn mm -hmm. structure white now has pawns on a4 and e4 black isn't fully developed i'm going to try to play a5 maybe bring my rook up with a rook lift and it just feels easier to play this position for white even though ultimately i think that black isn't in bad shape <laughs> white just is first to uh, the punch absolutely and should we also ch i'm just checking quickly back anna and and, and sarah they are Whoa. finishing off their game as well and it's really interesting um because both sides have some crazy tactics here queen takes f2 okay so sarah goes for the and if she takes the knight well the knight on c6 is also hanging does white try to keep the knight here she's down a pawn so she probably should eh yeah because king takes f2 there's actually rook c8 what an important move pinning the knight so you can take the knight six with the rook if you take like the pawn right away you lose the c6 pawn so that actually is a really nice tactic there by Sara. And just by looking at this position, I felt like Black's king was in some big trouble here. And queen b6, like that's such an obvious looking move going for a checkmate. But then queen takes f2 happens. You're like, oh my gosh, now I have to uh, try to find a way out of this position where I'm down a pawn. So really nice find by Sara. Her tactics seem to be um, in good shape today. And for Anna, this start already down one point. Let me ask you, Alexander, do you think she's going to be able to hold this game? 44 she's down she's down an entire minute um i don't know i i think she's not just down an entire minute but she's also off on the wrong foot in her match so i think it's going to be really difficult agreed though we did see her yesterday go down three games to none against uh Mung Zul and then win in the bullet 
that's true. So she was able to recover, but uh, that was after the time control changed. And we don't see that just yet. Oh, Night C3 is kind of an interesting idea. Knight takes, and then um, if Black takes back with the pawn, even though it's past, the White King is so close, she'll be able to come get it back. So I guess Black can retreat her knight, just put it on F6. Because isn't it easier to draw games with, when you're up a pawn just when you have knights? So why isn't she going for the trade? I guess she figured that, you know, Anna knows that. So if she drops her knight back instead of a rook trade, the rook will move off the E file. But ultimately, I do think that knight of six or knight D6 right now is a very good idea. So I do think that uh, Sar should go for that. I guess if she does play something like knight of six, um, Anna doesn't have to trade off rooks. She could just go for like rook D1 check with tempo and get out of there. Why is Anna hesitating to take on F5? Shouldn't she want to create an isolated pawn? Absolutely. Now is the time to do that. Take on F5. As you were pointing out, put the rook to D1 and the king F3, king F4. Okay, she's hesitating. And now G takes F5 isn't necessarily... Be okay, I, I thought Sarah could have taken with a king too, which looks really weird. But I, I guess she thinks that this pass pawn is an advantage and not a weakness. Yeah, and she wants to keep her king on e6 so that this rook can't come down to d7 and start mm -hmm. harassing the pawns on the seventh rank. And now we have a position where exactly what you were saying might happen, Alexandra. It's an extra pawn for black, but the king is blockading the pawn. And this looks like a position where with best play, it, it looks to me much closer to being a draw than a win for black. Uh, especially yeah, now. absolutely, because there's no way that you can make progress with your past pawn. Okay, and now she just lost the extra pawn, so it should be a draw. Hey, Anna, Anna seems like she'll, she'll have held this position. Showing off some really good endgame technique, and now she's going to survive this game. And that has to be good for her chances, good for her confidence, because she has been struggling out of the gates. And if she, whoa, so King G5 is giving up the B7 pawn. Okay, the, her point is that if she wins the A2 pawn, all right, so then it should now be level. I thought she was going to go for the H3 pawn and give two connected pass pawns. Of course, Anna is like, nah, that's, I mean, sorry, Sara's like, no, nah, that's not what I'm going for. I'm just trading off in this way. And honestly, if any side's better, it's white, but it's just should be a split point. Yeah, uh, I think that is fair. Although Anna has, I, you did say that Anna did pretty well in the shorter time control. So I don't think she's bound to blunder here or anything like that. Don't play rook h8 and take on h4 because it's rook b4 check. Ah, good, good find. Um, okay, well, she still has to prove that she can hold a draw here. Um, the the king, as you said, rook g3 now doesn't work because she wins the pawn. And actually, even if the rooks are traded, her, her king is already getting to h1, and that's a draw without rooks. And right. she knows that, and she goes for it. There we go. Here we see it. It's a draw by insufficient material, which means there are no pieces on the board. And so that means that Sara... She goes up two games to one as we mm -hmm. enter the next time frame. Alexandra, it's time for our break. You ready for it? I'm ready, Robert. I'm so ready. I don't know about you, but I'm really excited for our break. Couldn't be more excited. There's nothing I enjoy more in chess commentary than taking a break. And, well, that's a joke. I love talking about chess. But it is time for our break. We will be back in a few minutes. We'll be refreshed and ready for the quicker time controls. You will not want to miss this action from the FIDE Chess.com Women's Speed Chess Championship.
And we return here with the three plus one time segment upcoming. Alexandra and I were having some fun during the break, just, you know, making sure that we are ready and in shape to cover the rest of this action. We have two matches in the quarterfinals remaining. We have Ana Muzichuk down a point against Sara Kremo Sharia. And then we have Harika Dronavali trailing the chess queen, Alexandra Kostenyuk, two to one. So, Alexandra, I just mentioned another Alexandra. Now it's time to talk to you. As you see the players with a one game lead, do you think they're able to retain that advantage, or do you think the players will mount a comeback as they face the deficit? I should probably not do that thing where I just talk generally and don't give any predictions, right, Robert? You can do what you want. You know, you are a strong, independent woman. Okay. I think now that the time control is going to be shorter, um, that's where Anna will play a little bit better. So I think Anna is going to make the gap smaller. Um, and I think Kostinuk is just so good at all time control that she's going to keep her gap. All right. I can, I can see that. I think Kostinuk is just playing so well that I'm also going to join you with that uh, vote of confidence and go with her. And then Anna, I, I do agree, especially after yesterday, she was down three games to none and then outplayed Mungzul throughout the three minute and then the bullet portion. However, Sara, to her credit, is higher rated than Mungzul and has been playing very well in the WSCC. And well, this position already, as we see between Anna and Sara, is very sharp. The queen is on mm. B6, which actually staring at F2, the knight on E5 hitting the C4 pawn. And this knight on B5 is trying to get to C7 at some point. So it's a wild opening that has some deep theory that I personally don't know. Yeah, I don't know this theory here. It looks really tricky. So there's a knight hanging, but she's also attacking the queen at the same time. Um, there was a check that she could have also blocked with the bishop to attack the queen, but knight just retreating to c3 makes sense. Although it seems like then she just provoked a6 with her knight b5 move just to create a weakness. But now isn't c4 hanging? This opening is so crazy. This reminds me of Jan Nepomneshi. He was the black side of this against Anish Giri from the Candid Sermon, although White definitely did not castle in that game. It was, a, it was a pretty odd game, honestly. And now I'm looking at this knight on a4. B5 would trap the knight, but the rook on a8 is hanging, so you can't get away with that. D5 is another move I'm thinking about, but I was worried about e4 and just breaking the whole thing open. So bishop b4 was the ultimate choice by Anna. And, well, Alexandra, does Black have a good position here up a pawn, or does White have sufficient compensation? Well, let's see. What are the weaknesses in Black's position? I, I guess it's the dark squares on the queen side and the bishop on c8 that isn't developed yet, and it's busy defending b7. So I think white certainly has enough compensation. I guess there's also like the D6 square, but you don't have time to jump with your knight into it. And it's also defended right now. Um, and potentially after a move like A3, if white's able to keep the bishop pair, then I'd say it's certainly enough. I like your move A3. You're encouraging or sort of forcing black to take on C3 and those dark squares, whether it's B6, D6, C7. You just see that with black's pawn structure the way it is on the light squares, the dark squares are going to be an issue to uh, hold down. So A3 played by Sara after quite an extensive think there of a minute and four seconds. That's what she spent on that move. Wow. Wow, that's a really long time. <laughs> It certainly is. And all right, we have the position that you anticipated. I think that black should castle. I don't really like having the king in the center too long. D5 is another tempting move, but anytime there's D5, E4 will be played. So now we see that E4 played anyway. The good news for black is the bishop is shut off for the moment. The bad news for black is D5 is not happening anytime soon with all of white's pieces staring at the square. Okay, well, now white has to get this when, when you're playing and you're down a pawn um you either get some kind of dynamic position or you got some kind of strategy to win your pawn back right i i don't while i like sarah's position i don't know what the way forward is if that makes sense i think it makes perfect sense it kind of reminds me of a smith mora to some extent because in the smith mora that's against the sicilian opening where whites are e4 in the first move in this game Whites are with c4, but either way, white gives up a pawn for very quick play. And this queen trade being offered, typically when you're down material, 
you do not want to trade queens, and white is currently down a pawn. However, in this position with the bishop pair, you could certainly think about it, and I don't really want to move my queen back. I just put my queen on d4. So I do think that Sara can take and maybe should take on c5, as otherwise I don't see why she played queen d4 in the first place. Right. So queen takes c5, d takes c5, um, and she wants to attack the pawn on c5 after. At some point, she'll have to protect b2. And in terms of Anna's plan here, where is she getting that bishop? She can't push b6 right away because there's the e5 idea. Yeah, that's very frustrating with this bishop on g2. This e5 idea always exists. I think knight a5 kind of saves you a tempo because you're hitting this pawn on b3. And she plays knight to e5, which is more natural in centralizing the piece. I'm just kind of concerned about an eventual f4 and e5 and just that kind of progress, but maybe the knight's coming into d3. It's a mixed bag of a position. That's a good way to put it. Um, okay, so the knight's gone to a a4. The only idea is the pawn on c5. You don't want to play something like knight b6 because you already have the bishop there, and that's the worst piece on the board. Um, okay, finally, she got her pawn back. So clearly the gambit did work out for her. Yeah, she's going to take on c5, and the good news for Anna is she puts her bishop on c6. So she was able to develop that bishop that was struggling back on c8. She connects her rooks. White has to be better in this position. You have the bishop pair. You have even material. Bishop f4 kicks this knight out already. I like White's position, that's for sure. Yeah, um, and I like it. I don't know if I'd be able to win with it, honestly. I'd probably um, not play it accurately, end up getting a draw, or maybe even losing but, um, you know, th this is why we're watching some of the top player games, because they know how to convert them. Don't be so hard on yourself, but we do need to switch games. I, I simply must. And the reason why, as we go to the game between Kostenyuk and Harika, is Black is now down a piece and getting checkmated. I just saw the mating attack happening, and so I had to flip the game. And I want to show that That was a great call. Because... Around these parts, I move 20. White went d5, and I'm like, what in the world is going on here? White is down a piece, but the king is in the center with no pawns in front of it. And then the game continued with a sacrifice of this rook on d1 to get this pawn all the way to b7. And not only did that pawn get to b7, it promoted with a queen sack on d2. She went rook takes d1, giving up her queen so she could promote the b pawn into a new one. What a fantastic performance there by Kostenyuk. And she took on d2 with her king of all things. Like she took with the rook on d2, there was rookie one check and queen e3, which wins this rook on d1. So instead, she took on d2 with the king. What a brave player winning this game, Alexandra Kostenyuk. Man, her her online chess and her classical chess is just so impressive. It is for real, winning that game. And let's go on to the new game between those players. Uh, unless you want to switch over back to the... Maybe we should because they have less than 20 seconds each. Okay, let's go back to the uh, Anamuzi Chuck and uh, Sara Kadamal Sharia game here. Whoa, there's a knight on c5 and an outside pass pawn. Looks great for white. Yes, it does. Um, it seems like she should be able to either promote that pawn or win the c pawn. 15 seconds to 5, so Sara is also up a little bit of time. And her, she's bringing in her king as well. Okay, well, this almost seems over because she's grabbing c6. She'll have two fast bonds. Even if she loses h2, it doesn't matter because they are promoting too quickly. And that is why we got a resignation from Anna Muzichuk. Ooh, I predicted she was going to close the gap, but that is not a good start. It is not. No. And it's three to one in Sara's favor. So, I mean, Sara is extremely strong. And she's playing this line again with g6. So we're going to see this weird knight a5 line that I'm just going to have to start learning. Instead of me being like, hey, this looks wrong. And I'm just saying, hey, let me study this because this whole bishop a2 and black's knight is on a5 looking weird over here. I don't know what to make of this stuff. Yeah. I, I don't like playing unusual openings as in when my opponent plays something unusual because you feel like you're supposed to prove the reason why it's not correct. And it's so hard to do if it's not a classical game and you don't have time to. That's true. The onus becomes on you psychologically. You're like, I need to win this game. And by the way, Bishop takes B2 was going to be met by Bishop to D4. So she was giving up an exchange was on the Muzi check. And instead, Sara doesn't take it. I, I just like White's position. And that's the problem when you play these offbeat lines 
is there are some moments where you can get your opponent in territory that's unfamiliar to them and obtain the advantage. And then other times you get in a position like this, where after queen takes d4, isn't black left with an isolated d pawn? The pawn four is overextended. The knight on b7 is fianchetto in a way you probably don't want it to be. It just mm -hmm. feels like white's position has all the pluses. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. And in terms of what black can do then in that case, well, we're missing our dark square bishop. We have to fix that knight. I mean, the knight on c5 has had such a long journey already, but at least now the bishop on c8 can develop to b7. And I guess the plan here is to put pressure on the e4 knight, move the queen back on b6, as we've seen in a lot of these games, and just activate the rooks on the open and semi-open file. Yeah, I'm going to go back just to this uh, move 17 after bishop takes d4. I really like queen takes d4. I know that the knight wanted to capture on d4 to free up this bishop on a2, but the queen on d4 looked like it restricted black's pieces. There was no knight c5 with the queen there, so I would have preferred that capture had I been playing this game, but I understand Ana's choice, and now in this position, d5 chosen. I'm looking at e5, trying to break through with e6, and you know all about a bishop on b7 locked in by its own pawns, don't you? Okay, Robert. I've only heard that three times. We're going to need some new material for, from you. Well, I'll get some new material when you learn some new openings. So I am learning new openings, actually. Ooh. So work on your material, Hess. Oh, well, I mean, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. How was I supposed to know that? You play the French all the time. Not anymore. Like, I, I don't play it as much in online chess. I honestly got tired with the French. Even making up an opening and playing something I don't know theory with generally does better in my online games, which is really roasting the French there. We're, we're going to talk about this uh, later. I don't want to give away your preparation, especially on your road to uh, 2300, so you can Thank you. save. Thank you. I was going to say shave your eyebrows. I meant save your eyebrows. And here we see a position. I mean, this looks really, really nice for white. And the reason why, this pawn on A5, pawn on B4, both pawns are overextended. But if black starts going queen takes a5, I'm already looking at this move e6 to break open black's king. White has an extra pawn from the e to the h file. On the king side, is extra pawn for white. This bishop on a2 is better than the bishop on b7. Bishop on b7 protecting d5. Bishop on a2 at least being a little bit more aggressive. And the placement of the white knights, that feels like all things considered here, just a nice looking position for Anamuzichuk. Well, that's really important because in terms of momentum, if she wins this game two versus three, when there's only a one point gap, you feel like you're ready to come from behind, right? You do, for sure. And, you know, you start building that confidence that at, to this point, she probably uh, doesn't feel like she uh, has. And uh, just take on e6 and take, put the rook there and then bring the next knight to d4, the stunt doubles. By the way, Alexander Kostanek, oh my gosh, that's checkmate. What just happened what? here? Is Knight takes. Oh my! Oh my, oh my God! Took... She blundered. Well, I guess she blundered by allowing that in the first. No, she already had a really tricky position though. But it, it did seem like a bit of a blunder. Oh, she should just take this knight on e three and then try to go queen d five check and trade the queens. And I don't think White's in too much of danger here. Instead. After takes queen e7, queen g2 is mate in one. That's sad. We're going to move on from this game because, you know, that, that hurts to look at. We'll go back to the on the game against Sara here. 4-1. Jeez, what a gap. Yeah. Oh, man. Okay. This, this king looks open. How do I attack it, though? How do I actually make progress? That is always the question I ask you because I feel like most players – are good at understanding when they're better, but not as good at understanding the best way to actually make progress in an already better position. And this, I mean, look at this rook on g7 here. <laughs> Robert changes the subject. Yeah. Okay, yes, the rook on g7. Wait, what'd you say that I changed the subject? About? <laughs> because I was trying to get you to come up with a plan for white here. Oh, well, I was going to, but I just want to start with the rook on g7. Oh, okay, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry that my response wasn't good enough for you. It feels like so by the way, I'm queen c5, your best. queen c5, I can just go queen takes g7 check and have a knight fork on e6 at the end. Right. And knight f5, I feel like I should go queen f6 and go queen e6 check. The king is too exposed. So when I was going to come up with a plan, instead I'm just talking about the specific moves. It's going after this king on g8. It is out in the open. Mm -hmm. For now, black is up a pawn. That's the good news for her. But after queen e6 check, isn't... 
feels like White just winning material with maybe a knight f7 check as well. Well, so we can't play knight e6 because... Because queen d6 or... Yeah, pins the knight. Oh, no, but she played it anyway. Um, she listened to your advice. No, no, I, I was a question, not advice, Anna. Oh, God. Now what? Now our knight is no longer pinned because it's protected by the rook. I still think it's easier to play this position as white, even though you're down a pawn in a bullet scramble. King safety. Knight takes d5. Oh, gosh. Oh, she didn't take... That looked like a very free pawn. All right, but she could still actually just play for the initiative here because the pawn d5 is pinned, so queen c5 now. Keep f2 defended. Go after the b4 pawn. Mm -hmm. And the d5 pawn's also under attack. 11 seconds to 12, though. So let's. she has to be careful to not blunder any mates. I mean, even, especially after a move like d4, g2 is already under attack. Knight f3 is incoming now, too, putting pressure on h2. And winning the exchange. And winning the exchange. Yeah, she could have... Oof. Oh, yeah. no, Anna, this is rough. So we're seeing four ones in both of these matches. Sara's just playing really well in time trouble. She is. She really is. Um, okay, it's not actually over yet. Being down in exchange is not so bad, especially when the Black King is so open. I didn't know about trading bishops necessarily. I guess she's winning a pawn in exchange. Um, it's still easier to play for white because of the king safety. Wait, you think this is easier to play with white? Yeah, knights are tricky. Well, now it's not because queen one check just trades queens. So that ends that whole argument. Right, and, and the reason why this ends it is because um, the knight and the pawn, they don't work well together unless they have a king nearby because the knight can't just keep protecting, and that's why um, Sara was able to grab it. But there's still some drawing chances here, though. One pawn and a knight. Can't you just put her knight on e3 and then just shuffle? This should be, with proper play, should Don't be... blunder up the flag! Ah! She did. No! Oh, gosh. She, I, like she, she had a good position, and then she worked hard to save it, and then we got hit with the flag. Oh. oh no. Yeah, that that was that was rough. Let us switch games over to the Kastaniuk versus Harika matchup. Both scores are now four to one, and honestly, I started looking at the position, trying to figure out, oh, okay, is White just going to hold this? And the next thing I know, you're screaming in my ear about the the time, and you're, I'm sorry, you're right man. to look at the clock. No, don't apologize. I don't thought apologize. you were going to say I made you go go deaf or something. I was like, That's no, no, no. I, I can still job. hear you. We're still okay, having good. a conversation, so clearly, good. Um, I, I can hear. Just <laughs> letting you know. One but, minute later, Robert, what's that, Alexandra? <laughs> that will happen, I'm sure. What's this rook on b4 for Castanier? Like c5 is the immediate threat for Black, and mm -hmm. this rook on b4 just feels very out of play. Yeah, I mean. You, you never really want... I mean, the rook is not on an open file and it's in front of its own pawns. So that's super awkward. The good news is it keeps the knight on d8 stuck there for the time being. Although, that's just one piece, whereas the rook is... Oh, queen d5. Mm -hmm. Actually, I kind of like that. The bishop on the dark squares will be pretty powerful in these positions. True, but the pawn on d5 is so weak that I actually prefer black's position here because can't we try to get the black knight to somewhere like... I guess c5 would allow a trade, or e5. Get the knight on e5. Knight f7, knight e5. That's what's happening. You, and uh, it looks it. pretty solid for black unless there's a trade, but if it's a trade, then the black rook is going to be the one on the open file. Here comes the knight. And I think Kostanek is going to try to just shuffle now because she is in danger of having a worse position. So she's just trying to keep the status quo. And Harika needing wins. She's down three points in the match. She plays c6 to open up the position. And knight takes a5. Thank you for that pawn because then b3 wow. is Wow, she found a way to push for this. I mean, I thought black was slightly better, but I didn't expect her to, to get creative with it here. Knight c6, okay, so b4 is under pressure. It's protected by the bishop for now, but that way if rook takes g5, 
then you trade off and recapture. So it's actually a defensive move, both defending the knight and the g5 pawn. She takes anyway. I, I thought it would have been better to try to keep the tension here. Yeah, and now it's a clean extra pawn for Harika. Ooh, c5, though, that, that comes as a bit of a shock. Now you take on d6, and if knight takes his bishop b4, she drops the rook back. This g pawn, start pushing that thing. There you, you use go. As a decoy. Oh, we got Nicola in the chat. Good to see Nicola. He was a uh, VIP in the chess channel, and he's always helping the entire chess community on Twitch. Thank you so okay. much for the thousand bits for the chess channel. Ooh, thank you, Nicola. And this knight on c4 is on a light square, which is can't be kicked out by this dark square bishop. And the reason why Kostinik is holding very good drawing chances is because Black's p is tied down to the defense of this past pawn. And Black's pawns aren't that easy to push. However, I like what Harika has been able to accomplish in the last few moves. Rook c6 check. Knight d3 or knight c4. Okay, both are reasonable moves. Okay. And here come the pawns. Or the repetition. No. Nah. Okay, king f7. You gotta, you gotta push that king away. And keep pushing those bad boys over. I guess she has to she has to be careful to not just push pawns. Oh. What could go ah well isn't it cool when your players answer your question? What could go wrong? It just went wrong. Yeah, it's a simple draw king a4, rook takes a5, everything is traded off. And Oof. you need to play for a win in that position if you're uh, Harika. She can't right. afford draws, she's just down too much in the match. Yeah, I guess technically she could come back in the bullet if she feels like that's her strength. Um against Castania, good luck. Yeah, and 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 actually, uh, Harika's bullet is lower than her blitz. It's twenty four seventy two, and Kostinuk's is actually twenty four seventy three. So they both have lower bullet than their blitz. It's because you know they're chess players who actually respect the game. <laughs> uh, let's go to the other matchup between Sara and Arnold Spring Sara on camera, probably, and that way we can see how she's doing. From the white side of this position, she's up three points in the match. Although in this one, I like Anna's position. In the previous games, I think Sara's been doing quite well. Mm -hmm. But now Sara has her work cut out for her because look at the pawn structure. Isolated B pawn, isolated D pawn, open diagonal, potentially for H3 to come in with a mating pressure. Ooh. Oh, that does not look good. Those pawns are begging for trouble here queen f3 attacking the pawn on f4 queen's under attack now and it just gobbles up those pawns sarah is doing anything she can to get counterplay so i understand why she's put a boat is gambit i honestly ah i was gonna say i didn't see it right away oh my gosh that's just like sarah yeah, is just no 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 <laughs> But see, Robert, it's not just me. It's not just me. Can we please get that out in the world? I'm not the only one who, who pulls those off. I agree with I you. I need you to say it so that I could clip it. You are not Alex, the only person who blunders their queen on the regular. Thank you. But okay, you maybe, do, maybe you could add up with even grandmasters do it. Even grandmasters blunder their queen in time trouble. Great. I'm going to clip that. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I could do that for you. <laughs> Thanks, and... Robert. I'm just going to replay it in my sleep. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. <laughs> and I have blundered my queens before, so it's not like... And, you know, and nobody is immune from it. Everybody makes mistakes. It happens. And we have the same opening that we've seen before in this bizarre knight to b7, fianchettoing the knight, and then overextending the queen side. It's been working out for Sarah. She's playing really well in this match. So she continues to go forward with this opening. Sara has had this this hand position every game, actually. It's just a little bit unique. Anyway, back to the game. So Anna probably isn't feeling too good now. She can technically catch up, but a four-point gap. Has anybody come back with such a huge gap? Not to my recollection. And it is looking like a problem for her. The, we, the last time we saw this game... Uh, this opening, she was dominating before she ended up uh, really kind of botching her advantage. So right now, the pawn went to e5. There's the potential of e6. If I were Sara's coach, or if, you know, she has a break between time controls, I would probably stop playing this opening. It feels like it's very accommodating for Anna 
as the play is very natural for white and black struggles to figure out how to deal with this e6 move and this bishop on b7, which I have in green that I'm quickly turning to red because it's not a very good piece. That's fair, but at the same time, when she's up such a big gap, she probably feels like Anna is the one who needs to switch up what she's doing, no? I mean, in this line, though, it feels so nice for white to play this position. That's fair. That's fair. I I'm actually curious why she keeps picking it or what she likes about it. But, you know, we'll save that for the interview portion. So knight e6, she's challenging the knight in the center. If knight takes e6, she takes with the f-pawn and she's going to get a defender to b5, so it's no longer isolated. White probably doesn't want to trade the... I was going to say she doesn't want to trade the knight because if black ever takes, she takes back and puts another knight in the center. Um, but she does because I guess in exchange, she's attacking the pawn on b4 and activating her queen. Yeah, and the queen can swing over to g4. The rook on a1 can just come to c1. White's position is to be preferred at the moment. Mm -hmm. However, with the semi-open F-file and it's not like Black is um, without plans of her own. So I do think that Black has chances in a position like this for sure. Knight F5 is another move that I would consider uh, trying to gain space attack of the queen in the center of the board. I just ultimately think that White's structure is better and the bishop on B7, I'm still trying to figure out what to do with it. I mean, that has been the theme of all of these openings. What is what is that light squared bishop doing? Um, man, light squared bishops have a really hard time in certain defenses, don't they? Yeah, when they get caught behind their own pawns, thanks to your yeah. opening choices. Well, you know, I, I, kinda, I, I recently started playing this modern where you give up the light squared bishop and then close up the position, and it's been a much better time usually. I'm very happy for you. Thank you, and thank you. I mean that sincerely, despite it sounding <laughs> like I don't. And yeah, knight h4 just played. She wants to go rook f5 to put pressure on this knight on g5. The knight mm -hmm. also cannot return to f3 because the knight on h4 would be able to capture. Um, so what do you do here for white? Kind of an awkward position for the time being. Right. So, I mean, can you reposition? You can't, Yeah, you can't reposition your knight on g5. You can't push g3 to kick that knight away. Um, you could play your rook to c1 and at least fight for the open file. That seems like maybe the most intuitive idea here because it's the only piece whose position you're really improving. Rook c1 makes a lot of sense. And then if black plays h6, you're going to go knight to h3. And so black pushing pawns in front of her own king is probably not the ideal situation. Mm -hmm. However, you know, the knight on g5 coming to h3, which actually Anna plays first here, it's not like that's the best square for that piece either. Yeah. Okay. Well, she didn't like her knight on g5, which I guess I, I understand. But where is it going from h3? f4 looks interesting. A move like queen f7, does it do anything? Puts pressure on f2, doesn't allow the knight to come to f4. Okay. I see what you're doing, trying to just keep me a little bit tied down. Just a little, yeah. The, I can move my queen out to g5, though, because f2 is defended by the knight in h3. So as much as I've been critical about that knight going there, it does do something positive, and that just I should give it a little bit of credit where it's due. Right, and then I'm using my queen to tie down your knight, which is just not worth it. Um, this is different. I wasn't even looking at that side of the board. Wait. Wait, what is going on? <laughs> oh! What? Wait, why was b3 necessary to be played first? Oh, because now you're attacking a piece, I guess? Wow, that was that was interesting. I guess it doesn't work because of rook e3. Sometimes the simplest move is the best move. But the point was that, yeah, you're attacking this bishop on b3 and threatening rook takes on h3 to get your knight to the f3 square. So that was really fascinating. In another variation, if the rook were on f1 rather than e1, that would have worked out perfectly. I should make a mental note of that as a wonderful tactical idea all right well that was a very unique idea i will i will give the players that um but now black is down a pawn i guess you can take back e5 okay so she got back her pawn um i don't oh the knight can't move because of knight f3 no I, she can't both his gambit twice in a row right that's not oh okay it's a check it's a check. Sorry, I thought there was knight of three. I, I, I panicked. I panicked, Robert. But it's still winning because knight of three check anyway. Ah! Um, wait, wait, wait. Why not knight of three there? Wasn't knight she, of three winning? 
It okay. was. She stole a piece. She thought that was good enough. But yeah, she did blunder her queen point. two games in a row. Then remember how you said that she couldn't do that, and then she she kind of did. That's because every time I say something isn't going to happen in commentary, it does. It does. I'm done predicting. <laughs> So why don't you start predicting negative things so then positive things happen? Yeah, exactly. Um, COVID is going to last another year. No. That Wait, just, you, no. you meant in chess. That, uh, right, I knew no, that. Okay, that just, I killed that, the vibe. Oh, yeah. God. Uh, and Anna lost again. Well, at least I distracted everybody from the fact that it's 1-6. Right? That was good. Self-5? No? Okay, let's go to the next game. Um let's check on chess queen eh? yeah let's go over there and for, <laughs> um whew, i saw somebody saying why is hess so mean i'm just just a mean guy what can i say no i'm actually i, I try not to be but alexandra's a friend yeah of mine. you see hess walking down the street you turn the other way chat you turn <laughs> the other way <laughs> oh gosh cross to the other side of the street if you need to it's yeah, less Ro dangerous for you to jaywalk than to deal with robert run away run away <laughs> and speaking of running away aren't black's pawns just running down the board here i like, mean they certainly are but i guess chess queen also has that pawn on e6 um and i'm, I'm getting so this is going to be their last game five and a half one, man the, the gaps are just huge today reminds me of my teeth when i was growing up do you want to talk it? about that because gap teeth no, yeah, no, I know no. it's exactly yeah. what you meant. I just didn't know if you wanted to speak about it. No, I don't know. That wasn't the necessarily the best reference. Um, but yeah, I know I had a really big gap in between my teeth. Um, at some point, one kid was like, haha, I bet you could fit another tooth in between there. And I was like, oh, okay. Oh, you, you've had some bullies in your life. I'm starting to feel really bad. And uh, No, no, it's fine. This is not a therapy <laughs> session. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, we're supposed to be annotate not annotating analyzing chess games that we're talking about the gaps in your teeth and Dude, how mean kids are person. so mean growing up like chad is saying robert's mean but kids are worse you know who else is mean the pawns on the third rank i don't see how you can stop those the cool thing is uh, wait are there if there, there's two pawns on the third a rook can't stop them both either right that's true so it's just winning and the only pass pawn chess queen has the e6 pawn is blocks so even without calculating i feel like in intuitively there's nothing to do you can even take that pawn on e6 because the rook can't leave the first rank or you can play d2 which attacks the rook on e1 and allows you to queen the c pawn this is pretty over do you see any last tricks no, um, I'm asking you impossible questions, aren't I? I'm looking. I'm scanning the board. I see nothing. White's pawns are blockaded. Black's pawns are pushing. You know, C1 equals... Now I take on B7. Don't You don't want to allow white to queen. That's for sure. And now rook takes E7. Just steal it and then get your queen. Yep. Ch chess, chess queen getting beat by, by the queen here. I think we're going to see a resignation soon, but again, she's still going to be up by three points, quite a lead, and there's only the bullet portion, so it's very unlikely that she doesn't win this match. All right. Did well, she adopt a player in this tournament? She did. In the first round of the entire event, in the first Grand Prix leg, she won 11 nothing. Oh, my God. Who did she play against? I'm going to switch games back over to the other one. Uh, she was playing against Gunai Mamadzada. Okay, and and what was her her rating? Gunai's her like classical feeder rating is high twenty three hundreds or maybe over twenty four hundred. Got it. Okay, so so there is like some, somewhat of like a two hundred something rating gap between them. Makes sense. She's oh sorry, she's twenty four forty three. So not really much of a rating gap, and it was just a, I mean honestly a demolition. Speaking of demolition, how bad is this six one score? Anna. I mean, how unlikely did we think this was going to happen? Um, extremely unlikely. I mean, Sara, she she was my pick yesterday mm -hmm. when we looked at the bracket because she's made it to uh, both the semifinals in the previous Grand Prix legs that she's competed in, and she's been really strong, and she's a great player. She's having fun in this format. She's previously said she's looking forward to playing all these top players, 
and it's working out perfectly for her in this match. And Ana is just, it doesn't feel like we have the Ana Muzi check that we've become used to. Uh, right. She's the hunger queen in that game. We just saw that's not something you see every day. And, and, and I think that's the point. I wasn't saying that Sara isn't strong, just that so is Anna. Um, and she's just lost a lot of games in ways that is unusual to her chess play. Definitely. And it's frustrating when you lose a game and then you have to play another game immediately, you don't mm-hmm. have time to recover. You don't have you know, the, a whole day's worth of rest as you do in a classical tournament. And you just have to get over it and play the next game. And that, it's really hard for some players. And right now we see Anna Muzicek, she has a much better position in this game, but it's kind of too little too late. Yeah, although it's not too little too late because if she wins this game, nah, she'd have to win four bullet games, which technically is possible. So she's not lost. She's not lost yet. It is true. Uh, Four games, not impossible. You have to play very quickly and win all the games. And we did see Sara against Arena Crush. She was up three games Mm -hmm. and then she ended up getting tied because Irina won all the bullet games and then they went to a tiebreaker, which Sara won. So it is possible to score a comeback against a player who is well ahead on the scoreboard. Especially if it's right after a win, because then you start to get a little bit more confident in your play once again. And you're like, okay, finally got out of this, this losing streak here. Um, I love what she's doing now with Queen E4. So the white King has really weak light squares. So the threat now is Bishop H3. I guess she she just has to calculate and make sure there's no checks because otherwise you can't. I I guess you can't defend with bishop f1. The only way to defend is knight to f4, which attacks the bishop and protects the g2 square. True. Because bishop play... f1 would have been met by queen e1. Right. And here she still has queen e1, and just move the bishop away. And the f2 pawn it looks like it can't be defended. So bishop f5. Mm-hmm. There's no way to defend f2, in, at least not in a useful way. So good technique by Anna. Also, f6 traps the queen. Oh, it can't play f6, it's pinned. But you see what I was trying to do? I was trying to cheat. Oh, no, that's okay. Um, it didn't count. It didn't count when you're a commentator. So king h3, I, I'm just trying to find the mate here. It's always fun to try to find the mate. So like, you can put your queen on the back rank and threaten h1, but that's not forcing right away. So queen e3 check. Yep, and she's going to at least win the knight. Bishop e4 check, mm-hmm. and the, the knight's hanging. Yep, and she check. has 25 seconds versus 6, so she she has time to think a little bit here. Sara just resigns. Okay, well, hey, that's that's a one win for Anna. Well, that's a way to end the this time segment. It is a win for Anna Muzichuk. She faces, I mean, a gargantuan task to try to come back from this. She needs to win all her bullet games and do so quickly. In the other matchup, we have Harika Dronavali trying to initiate a comeback of her own. She just beat Alexandra Kostinyuk in that final 3-plus-1 game. She will also need to win all of her bullet games. So we'll see if that's possible when we return for more FidaChess.com Women's Speech Chess Championship action.
And we return ready for the bullet action here between Alexander Kostenyuk and Harika Dronavali, as well as Anna Muzichuk taking on Sara Kadem Al-Sharia. And Alexandra, it does seem like we have some lopsided matchups here in the second half of the quarterfinals. Any chance for a comeback? Yeah, I know you did say that there is some. I'm just trying to get your honest opinion. Very low chances. I think the more interesting question is if you had to bet on one player to come back, who would it be between um, Harika and Anna? Ooh, I like that. I'm going to go with Harika because she's down only three points rather than four. That feels like a safe. Oh, nice. A cool, boring, objective decision. Thank you, Robo Hess. What did you want me to say, Alexandra Botez? I guess something a little bit more creative. Like, well, now that Anna had a break and she was blundering, she's going to bring up her game in the bullet or, you so know. Now, now that you said that out loud, now that you voiced that, did that actually sound creative to you? Um, and more creative than she is up by one point. So numerically, she is closer to coming back. Um, I yeah. didn't really put it that I'm way. I'm pretty sure that I just replayed your actual clip. Uh, well, H4 was played by Anna. So she is going all in for the match victory here she needs to win all four games that she hopefully will even get to play because with the match timer 10 minutes of action doesn't matter if you want more games you're not getting any so the pawns on h5 she's going for a pawn storm on the king side what do you make of this decision bold i love these kinds of things in bullet they never work in blitz you shouldn't play them in classical but if there's ever a time control to do it try it in bullet um, I think she's also playing a little bit aggressively because she knows she has to win. Sometimes, though, when you make moves like that, you just end up getting in a worse position. I don't know if that's what's happening right now. Probably not, though, because after after you trade off, um, White's King is a little bit awkward, but so is Black's King. It's not really ideal to castle on either side. Yeah, Black stole a pawn, though. It really isn't feeling like this match is going on his way whatsoever. So I think that we should probably flip on over to the match between Harika and Alexandra Kostenyuk because that one started three games. Let's see what's happening in this mm -hmm. current game where Kostenyuk, what is, what is this? How many pawn? This is the weirdest position with this pawn chain from E3 all the way to H6. Yeah, okay, that is a weird looking pawn chain. I mean, we love seeing pawn chains, right? It just doesn't feel like a stable one. Usually you don't want a pawn chain so far away from your own king. That's right. And, you know, if you have some kind of attack, that'd be great. But the knight on the eight is a perfect defender covering the G7 square. So I don't actually see any sort of attack. And that's why Kostenik trying to trade off pieces here. Okay. Um, so pieces are being traded. Material is even. It's two knights versus a bishop and a knight. Which pieces are better at working together in this kind of end game oh now that the pawns on off the g7 the e3 pawn feels like the one that is in big trouble here and i do feel like the knight and bishop are coordinated extremely well right now but look at this knight g4 move trying to get into f6 and i would play king h was a nice move queen to b2 is coming black needs to be careful about her king yeah she definitely does a chat is saying how alexandra kostanyuk looks so concentrated yes chat that is her face as she's reading your comments to see who is misbehaving. That, that's exactly what she's doing. Now, knight e5 with the threat of queen h8 check, knight c6 is going to be pretty nasty. It's a fork. Yeah, that... Okay, well, there's there's no, no more fork now. Bishop um, g7, the queen's trap. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. Bishop g7? Then When the knight was on f5, the queen was trapped oh, there. Oh, oh! Okay, good. That was that was a nice one, but they missed it. Um, is there a perpetual here? Like queen d1, queen h5. Okay, where do you go after king g3? No, there's not a perpetual because there's one square she could escape from. And this is actually a really important game because Harika is now completely winning unless something goes wrong. And if she can win this game, she certainly will have time for two more after this. Yeah. That, that would, I mean, damn it, Robert, your prediction is coming true. Ugh. And You're just way, so freaking objective. It's hard to argue with you. <laughs> by the way, Anna Muzichuk, I think, is also winning her game. She had a bad position earlier on, but she looks like she's about to win her game and then move on to a three 
point deficit, so she will have a chance to mount a comeback as well. That was a tricky game. I'm, I'm surprised she was able to just just win it. Um, is wait, hang on. Are we about to see a checkmate here? The queen has come into f7, and now g6 looks really tempting, threatening. Queen takes h7. It's a That's draw. A nice it's check. a draw. Queen g2. Oh, no. Queen g2. Just keep oh, checking. No. Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! She pushed too. St- she shouldn't have allowed the check, or was it a draw? It may have been a draw, regardless, though, because that was a threat. No. No, she, she. That was an imprecise move order, and now, I think that. That's it. That's all that Kostenik needed. And she like she. You see that side of like, <sighs> managed to hold that one. The match should be mine. <laughs> now I can't stop pretending that Kostenik is like a cybersecurity expert who's just like really looking looking at people because she's so focused and so determined that it's a little intimidating you know <laughs> she just wants to win this chess match yeah exactly no i i know that's the real reason um cyber security <laughs> that, that's what you came up with well yeah because like that's the kind of job that you'd feel really intimidated to have someone looking at you like that you know Cybersecurity of all jobs? What's wrong with you? What, you didn't join your cybersecurity club in college? Did you? It was actually a club that you joined. Yeah, there was. My friend started it. Okay. Um, anyway, well, I, I mean, I, I, anyway. I've um, always thought you were really cool, Alexandra, and you just hit new <laughs> levels of cool. Thank you, Robert. I just always ascend to new heights, you know? I'm proud of you. Thank you. Have thank I told you that you. before? Um, yes, yes. Usually sarcastically, but it doesn't matter. I, I change the tone in my head so I hear what I want. Anyway, yeah. uh, sorry, I didn't mean to take away from, from the chess again. So we got two bishops and a weak pawn on d6. Unless there's any tactics, I do like Kostinuk's position better, but it's not winning. It's just preferable. She also has more time on the clock. Yeah, this is a really nice position for her. No weaknesses in white's position. Black, on the other hand, is and bishop takes d6. It's not even a weakness anymore because you're stealing the pawn. And once you take that, the rook on f8, the knight and c5 are both under attack. You cannot defend both. Rook c8 would be the attempt, but the bishop on f5 covers that. So it looks like Kostanik is stealing a piece the <laughs> game. Stealing the a piece and reading your internet history. <laughs> you really are not going to let this cyber It's not funny. Go. I just can't stop thinking about it. <laughs> I just... I, I, <laughs> i'm done i'm done i'm done oh gosh yeah she she won the game she won the game i mean she's so good at chess she's so good at chess yes she is good at that so should we flip on over to the other match to see if anna muzi checks making any progress uh yes three six three six so three points away she was a four point lead can she win this game she- actually she can robert there's rook I mean, d2, which is a threat. Bishop d4. Bishop d4. And now d2 is coming if you take on d4. Oh, d2. You don't take back. You push d2. That's so clever. Because now you cannot stop the promotion. The king cannot get closer. There's a line of fire. And there is no perpetual check because the king is snaking its way over. Oh, wow. bishop b6. Because rook d8 check. Oh, just what she had you, the game. Wait, wait. Can you not? Oh, and you can't play rook e8 because if you trade, the king can catch on. Uh-oh. Oh, oh no. Oh, it's just that kind of day. And Sarah... Sara discovered it. She was like, oh, I have a little tactic. That's why she gave so many checks. And that's been a theme today of Sara coming up with extremely cool resources. Yeah, that was really impressive. And to see that quickly with this time control, I mean, you got to give her credit where it's due. Um, okay, so she can go for perpetual. She's going to go for perpetual because she still has enough time to win the next games. Like no reason to push a position that's drawn. Right. Well, she only has two minutes and 24 seconds. So she definitely doesn't have time. Oh, this must be their bullet rating. So Anna's up a hundred points in terms of bullet rating. I think Sara's a little underrated. Probably from the way I've seen her play. (laughs) She's just a little good. A little Uh, bit. Yeah. I mean, these, these players are all super impressive. I mean, does does Sara have her GM norms? She has yes, at least two, if I'm not mistaken. At least two. Yeah, she's I mean, she's an incredible player, and I've said this many times at this point. Throughout the WSCC, she made the semifinals in both of her earlier two Grand Prix legs, and she's about to make the semifinals in this one. And she's somebody who I would say is probably underestimated, not by mm-hmm. her opposition necessarily, but when you look across the bracket and you see all these big names, she's extremely strong, but with 
a field full of extremely strong players, she probably isn't the first name that came to people's minds. However, she time and time again has proven to be a mighty force and is making it to a semifinals for the, her third Grand Prix event in a row. Wow. Well, that is super impressive. And I, you know, she, she's, she's, I, I think she's extremely famous in Iran, right? She is. Yeah. Um, anyways, so this is a pretty interesting position. So again, she has the Bishop pair. I think Anna's knight position is a little bit clumsy. It's not clear where they're going to go from there. Um, and black has more space on the king side. So this does seem like a nicer position to play for black. But it's not winning or anything like that just yet. No, it's just, not, as you said, better to play. And now with this bishop on f6, mm -hmm. uh, you just look at piece to piece. The bishop on e6 is doing very well and it's unopposed. There's no white score bishop for white. The double mm -hmm. pawns are something that black typically isn't thrilled about. But it's not like white can do anything with the extra pawn on the e through h files. Right, that pawn can go to e5, but then just putting it on a, a potentially vulnerable square. So actually, bishop takes c4 and rook to e8 may just scoop up that pawn in the near future. Okay. Well, now that e5 pawn is just going to be a target for the rest of the game. G4 doesn't work right away because f5 is hanging. I I'm always intimidated to have a queen pinning any of my pawns to my king but i don't see how how oh now g4 works because f4 isn't protected anymore uh anna's queen is really far away from defending okay but no no side took advantage of that i think your g4 move was a really good one instead we saw a series of trades where white has to be better because even material mm -hmm. the queen is nicely centralized and you know it's it's going to be an Oh no, I was I, I got news that the time's up. So that means Anna actually couldn't catch up from behind. And wait, wait, sorry, I, I was reading the Slack about how much time the players have. Did, was no, that I another thought, queen blunder? I thought you started clicking. Was that another queen? Ah! Third I, one in a row. Robert, I, is it me? Am I, I bringing this luck? I you, I was about to say I thought you went and started clicking on moves and were playing the game because of what just happened there. I mean it, and I'm going to send Anna like a personalized apology note because I feel like I cursed her or something. I think you kind of did, honestly. And um, well, that's the third one today. It didn't matter because the out match of was 11 over. games, though, three out of 11 is a lot. It is a lot. The match was over. So let's, you know, just say it didn't matter, right? The, the result of the match was already in the books. However, it really was kind of that kind of day. And I just said kind of many times in the same sentence, but that's just where we are at at this point with some mind boggling situations where Anna Muzic is such a strong player. We know how talented she is and she's perhaps not so experienced in online formats. Oh, speaking of Queens, that Queen on A7 is trapped in this last game here. So. so many Queens just suffering fatalities today. Holy smokes. Well, this yeah. was, these were the results we expected. So their game is going to get aborted because the time is up. So I think that means for us, Alexandra, the matches are over with. Sar Sadat Kanemal Sharia, she wins her match 7.5, 3.5 over Ana Muzichuk, and Alexandra Kostanyuk wins 9-3 to three over Harika. We are going to take a quick break and we'll be joined by a player for an interview. You will not want to miss that. So stay tuned, everybody. We'll be back shortly.
And we are joined by Grandmaster Alexander Kostanyuk here. First and foremost, congratulations on what was a pretty great victory. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. So take us through the match. How did you prepare for it and how are you feeling throughout it? Well, I mean, for me, the most important thing that I noticed um, lately is to be as calm as possible. As soon as things start going somehow unpredictable, mm -hmm. I mean, and I start to get nervous, then my brain stops functioning. And so that's the mo most important uh, thing that I really try to focus on. I mean, of course, uh, openings can be important, and, but as long as I keep calm uh, and my head functions I mean, normally the way, <laughs> the way it's capable of functioning, then everything goes well because um, I've had issues um, with my um, <laughs> mood uh, on, on the first week. I was very happy throughout the sec uh, my second tournament, uh, the third leg. And uh, this, uh, I mean, uh, this tournament, it started very shaky. I mean, yesterday I was not happy about the way I performed. Uh, too many uh, blunders and uh, especially I, I, I couldn't uh, keep calm. But today it was a little bit better. Uh, of course, I got lucky in some of the games. But, you know, this luck, it, it doesn't come out of nothing. So you really need to, you're playing against very strong opponents. And in order to make them make mistakes, make them blunder, you really need to <laughs> work hard. For sure. And you were leading from the start of the match, but it, it seems like you're talking about not being too emotional so that you're playing as objectively as possible. How did you not get overconfident? Well, it's not really about too emotional because, okay, I know that mistakes happen. It just uh, inside do not have, you know, uh, heart rate, uh, 200 uh, beats per minute. And <laughs> that's kind of more physiolo physiological things that unfortunately I'm not capable of uh, um, uh, control. Because, right. uh, okay, emotions, uh, it's hard sometimes, especially after blunders, but still you're... You are trained to control them uh, throughout your career. You have many ups and downs, but some physiological things that I'm just uh, probably, uh, I mean, <laughs> I should <laughs> take some pills, okay, that are allowed, of course, but uh, I've never really used them and I don't really want to, um, <laughs> to get into this field. So um, when this heart rate starts to increase and you just cannot focus and you are because of that you're making mistakes that's what uh, i'm not satisfied usually with but as long as uh, i i mean keep calm and my heart rate is like <laughs> not under 200 but at mm -hmm. least 150 <laughs> everything uh, is uh, goes well well, let me ask you a question because you're talking about control and you control your own destiny. Whereas if you win this Grand Prix leg, you qualify for the Super Final. So tomorrow you play Sara and she also needs to win out. Do you think that helps that you're playing somebody else who is in the same exact boat as you? Or does you, know, you just have to do what you have to do and you're not focused on anybody else? tell you the truth i've become a fatalist i mean in the last uh, decade or so because i've seen so many things that you cannot really explain so many blunders i mean from people that they will not i mean they will never make this blunder except this one second and uh, so i mean i'm i have this attitude that i should uh, focus i mean i should do what i'm capable of doing i mean my best at this exact moment but then it's not up to me to decide yes it's good of course uh that uh, it's up to me whether i qualify or not and not about somebody else's results but um i mean it will be the way it will be and of course i will try to do my best uh to to play for a win and from these three different for time formats that you've been playing has there been one you're most comfortable with or least comfortable with I don't like playing bullet. <laughs> I, I, ha I don't have a lot of experience and uh, it's just too fast for me. But I think for the most of the players in this tournament, they can say the same. So I prefer three plus one because five mm -hmm. plus one, it's a little bit too serious, <laughs> too long. <laughs> <laughs> Online, at least you feel that. Uh, so three plus one is my favorite uh, part. 
Well, based on your performance, you know, you've had some really dominant performance, including the first match of the entire event. You won all of your games. So, I mean, it seems like you're impressive and can handle all three time controls. Well, I mean, you should be. And um, uh, every single player has the same situation. So if you are not doing well in one control, it's your problem. So you should either train or get more points in the other part of the match. Uh, everything is in the same condition. Everyone is in the, is in the same condition. I have one more slightly controversial question since it is speed chess. Do you think bullet is bad for a classical chess? Well, it just doesn't have anything to do with classical chess, actually. As in, do you think playing too much bullet makes you play worse classical chess? Probably. I don't know. I've never, I've never played too much bullet because it's really not interesting for me. I don't consider it to be chess. <laughs> it's something it's about to use you, your mouse skills and uh, i don't know your reaction and um, you really need to see fast like little little tricks and uh and then but at least we're playing with incremental time uh, to keep the logic uh, of the game at least a little bit but as i have already said in one interview recently that uh, i consider online chess as a separate uh, discipline so we have classical chess we have rapid chess we have blitz chess and now we have the on online chess with its uh, pluses and minuses but i think uh, in the moments like this, it's a good al alternative, at least I'm enjoying very much these online tournaments and they give me the same kind of specter of emotions. Well, you're certainly playing very well and impressing a large number of our fans. So thank you so much for joining us and uh, we'll let you get your rest and good luck tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks. That was Grandmaster Alexander Kostenyuk. And as you look at the leaderboard right now, you see that she is in fourth place. At least she was heading into uh, this final Grand Prix leg. And look at fifth and sixth place. Those two players are still in this event. So Alexander Kostenyuk, Sara Sadat, Karem Al Sharia, and Hoi Fan, they all control their own destiny. And Alexandra and Sara play tomorrow. So as you look at this leaderboard, Alexandra, and this is you, Miss Botez, when you look at the leaderboard here, I mean, we know exactly what the players need to do. They need to win. Otherwise, it's Anna and Valentina making it through the Super Final. Which of those three, or those four players, I should say, are going to join Anna Ushanina in the Super Final? I think Kostanyuk is one of the the favorites to join there. I'm not saying that just because we talked to her, but she's so consistent across five minute, three minute and bullet. And she's one of the players who is consistently doing well in women's speed chess championships and title Tuesdays. She's used to not only playing online chess, but also streaming it. So I think it's a matter of she's already higher rated and she's very active. She certainly is. And well, Ifan can control her own destiny as she is still in the mix here. She won her match earlier today. So with Sara and Alexandra playing against one another, we will see if who will go on to the final and, see, and we'll also see, of course, if Ifan makes it. So remind everybody, the semifinals are tomorrow, same time, same place, 5.30 a.m. Pacific time. That is 8.30 a.m. Eastern. And wherever else you're in the wor world, you can do a quick little Google search to figure that out. And Alexandra, you and I will be back tomorrow. I'm certainly excited to see this tournament as it you know, heads down the wire here, down the stretch. Any final thoughts about today's action and what to expect tomorrow? Hopefully less queen blunders, Robert. That's all <laughs> I'm going to say that on what I'm hoping won't happen. Um, I'm excited. I've really been enjoying the games. I like the rapid time format. What about you? Any final thoughts? Well, I mean, I thought that Humpy Kunero winning against Valentina Gunina was uh, very unfortunate for Gunina, who's played very well throughout this uh, cycle here. And it will be Humpy Kunero versus Hui Fan tomorrow. How could you not be excited about that one? And on the other side of the bracket, we will have Sara Sadat Kadem Al Sharia taking on uh, Alexandra Kastenia, who we just heard from. She's in great form. And she says, hey, I'm a fatalist. I control my own destiny. We'll see if I'm up to the task. So on that note, we will bid everyone adieu. It's been a fun event. We still have two more days of this tomorrow and then Sunday. The semifinals will continue in the FIDE Chess.com Women's Speeches Championship, but that will be tomorrow. In the meantime, enjoy the rest of your Thursdays, everybody. Happy chessing.